Can you hear me now? Уважаемые коллеги, а, туда? А, вот уважаемые коллеги, слышно меня? Хорошо? Давайте посмотрим, кто сейчас уже у нас есть из участников секции. Так, это у нас два онлайна. Кузнецова Вера Владимировна. Где здесь? Так, дальше. Очно. Нинель Яковлевна. Так, Елена Евгеньевна. Так, вот кого не будет у нас. Виктор Борисович. Так, Ксения Валерьевна. Так, Елена Владимировна. Так, Игорь Викторович. Так, Игорь Викторович. Это у нас военный институт. Есть здесь, есть здесь. здесь. Анна Николаевна Налобина. Анна Николаевна. Она, может быть, ушла на другую секцию, да. она здесь. Она сказала, что... Да, да, так, да, дальше да, у нас да. идет Китай. Так, это онлайн у нас. Это онлайн, это у нас онлайн. Со столированной связь. Со столированной. Со столированной. Мы сейчас, наверное, выйдет в 11 часов только. Наверное. А вот товарищ, который там сидит, кто отвечает за онлайн, может проверить связь? Так, а у нас... Со связью у нас кто работает? У нас Столяров первый идет, Владислав Иванович. Вернее, вторым идет после Джим Перри, да. Прошу прощения, можно попросить пропустить, если, если есть возможность, вперед? А то у нас занятия сейчас идут, и я еще на второй секции выступать должна. Извините, пожалуйста, можно попросить? Это кто говорит? Людмила Ивановна, Людмила Ивановна, это Шумова Наталья Сергеевна. Добрый день, а, Людмила добрый Ивановна. добрый день. Здравствуйте. Шумова на связи, слава Богу. Да, если, если можно меня пропустить, пожалуйста, а то мне надо еще на, на вторую секцию еще подключаться. И еще занятия учебные. Так, Наталья Сергеевна, еще раз, еще раз повторите просьбу, просьбу вашу. Вы могли бы меня сейчас подключить, пропустить вперед, а то мне надо еще на вторую секцию переключаться. И занятия учебные идут. Если есть возможность, пожалуйста. А, так, а, Наталья Сергеевна, а можете выступить третий? Да, хорошо, спасибо Все, большое. Спасибо большое. Так, третий. После столярового будет. После столярового. Я сейчас к нему сейчас все проверим и спрошу, как он выступает. Он вчера звонил, сказал, что он в Казани выступает параллельно. А он в Казани еще. Он на месте не сидит. Нет, он поехать не мог, он тоже в онлайне. Я имею в виду, что на месте не сидит, он мотается. Нет, он сидит как раз на месте, он никуда не... Ну, ему уже за 85. Ну, да. Он не выезжает и не выходит из дома. А, ну мы с ним года два назад в Казани ездили вместе, то есть бодрые. Сейчас нет, э, все занятия ведет в онлайне, ага. мы его не видим вообще. Ясно. И каждый раз, когда он уходит в онлайне, mm -hmm. на, на кафедре, у него вечные какие-то проблемы. Ага. Я почему не волнуюсь, что не было ни разу, чтобы он вышел, и у него все хорошо было.
начинаем. Уважаемые коллеги, добрый день. Dear colleagues, uh, we are uh, uh, opening the first session. Uh, the global sports um, space in the contemporary world challenges the prospects of the development and consolidation of the contemporary international sports movement. Actual philosophical, axiological, culturological, and moral components of the Olympic movement, Paralympic, Surd Olympic sports and uh, the global movement, sports for all. Allow me to remind you that uh, presentations are no longer than 10 to 12 minutes. We work till 6 o'clock. Oh, we break um, at 2 for one hour. So, dear colleagues, um, allow me to represent the, man, the monitors uh, or moderators of the session. Professor of the Chair of Psychology, Philosophy and Sociology of the Russian University of Sports, uh, Salivka, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the journal Theory and Practice of Physical Culture, Doctor of Pedagogics, Professor Людмила Лубышева. Uh, a member of the uh, Academy of Military Historical Science, expert of the Interparliamentary Assembly of the CIS countries, Doctor of Political Science, Professor Vladimir Pish. Uh, Mr. Nasrallah Hassan Fayez from Lebanon, candidate of pedagogics. Uh, you're, you're very well familiar with him, yes. Uh, he uh, will allow me to give the floor to Doctor of Pedagogics, Ludmila Lubesheva. A few words of greeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, uh, dear participants of the Congress, participants of our session, uh, judging by the name and the title of the session, we are to discuss uh, quite a wide range of different issues. And uh, each and uh, every one of us will represents um, a narrower topic, but try to make sure that considering the wide range of presentations we have, Try to make sure, uh, I repeat, uh, that every presentation is interesting, not only to those who are well familiar with your theme, but to everyone else um, and uh, all the participants of the session. I would like to wish all of you fruitful and interesting work to make sure that it leaves a trace in our life, in our souls, and maybe a line in the curriculum vita. So I suggest that you take active part in the discussion, ask questions. We will provoke you. Um, um, we want you to ask questions. Uh, and you know that the moderators are, doing, are expected to do exactly that. We are to discuss the most interesting and topical issues in each presentation. So be ready to ask questions to make sure that our session is truly interesting and leaves a trace in the annals of our Congress. Well, right, let's begin. Now, uh, Doctor of Political Science, Professor Vladimir Pish will also say a few words of greeting. Esteemed colleagues, uh, dear friends. Now, uh, it seems to us that it's quite important uh, uh, to remember that um, uh, sports, uh, people, and uh, uh, health 
um, this is the theme that is uh, in the focus of attention not only of the narrow professionals, so to speak, but it's actually uh, the theme that is that concerns the humanity in general, which is logical indeed, and uh, conditions of those uh, geopolitical shifts that occur at the political map of the world still in the focus of attention, there is a human being. And uh, a lot depends on how well um, they are, uh, the human beings are socialized, how strong and healthy they are physically. The uh, future uh, of the humanity depends on that. So um, uh, we are at the first session, at the, the, the uh, session today, and uh, here we are professionals, specialists, uh, experts, uh, and um, uh, we are willing, we're ready to uh, put forward some of the ideas, some of the solutions uh, um, of ours uh, so that um, the challenges and the problems indeed that emerge in the um, sports um, life in the world are implemented properly. We expect fruitful and interesting work. Success to all of us. All the best to you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I uh, welcome everyone at the session. Um, session number one, which is probably the most important one, indeed, number one among all the others. And I'm happy to uh, be one of the moderators uh, today. And indeed, let's try to uh, work together in a well-coordinated way uh, uh, in order to uh, get good results of uh, our joint work today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Off we go. So our first speaker is already connected to us, Professor um, um, from, the, uh, from the Czech Republic, um, the Karlov University in Prague, Jim Perry, Professor of Philosophy. Uh, he will, as a sex, gender and uh, categorization in sports. Okay, can I start? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, you are audible, sir. Good. Can I start? Can I begin? Yes, you da, can da, begin. Da, da. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers, firstly, for inviting me. Uh, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in St. Petersburg again. Uh, and I thank the organizers also for their flexibility in rescheduling my session after yesterday's difficulties. So now, let's get straight on with the presentation. Um, I hope you can see that. Good. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm speaking... Good, thank you. I'm speaking today in a particular context. Last month, World Athletics announced a ban on transgender athletes. Uh, not all transgender athletes, but transgender women, right? So, Co says... The council has agreed to exclude male to female transgender athletes who've been through male puberty. Uh, 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 
главный звук. I'm sorry, I can hear some uh, somebody talking in the background. Um, <clears throat> to exclude them from female world ranking competitions. So uh, we're in a situation where the contested women's category is at issue. <clears throat> Firstly, then, we have to make a clear distinction between sex and gender. So sex is a matter of biology. We should refer to this as the male-female difference. But gender is a matter of culture, a matter of social acceptance. And here we should use the terms man and woman. Now, here's the problem. Sports organizations often speak in gender terms. We say men's football, or we say women's tennis. But the sex category in sport refers to sex, not to gender. It should really be called female tennis, not women's tennis. And here's why this is a problem. If you accept that gender is a matter of culture, a male can self-identify as a woman. You can self-identify as a woman because that's the cultural category. But you can't self-identify as male because male is the biological category. And sport uses category of sex, not gender, for its, uh, its sport categories. Now, here's the important point. You can't self-identify into a sport category. If you, if you could do that, it would not be a category, okay? So, you know, I'm an old guy. Uh, but say I wanted to play football uh, in, in the under-18 team. Could I self-identify as 17 years of age? Of course not. You can't self-identify into the category of youth sport. You either are 18 or you're not. So what's been happening in athletics has been that, and in swimming, has been that males have been self-identifying as women and then they've been allowed into the women's sport category. Now, now you see why we have to distinguish sex from gender. Okay, but my main interest is in the idea of classification in sport more generally. So the aim of this paper is to examine the basis of eligibility rules in sport. And there are many pre-competition categories for which we make provision in sport. Sports have age categories, sex categories, weight categories, ability categories. Why? We have these categories because they're directly relevant to sport performance. Uh, your body weight is directly relevant to how much you can lift. So weightlifting has weight categories. It's obvious. So let's think a little more deeply about classification, about categorization. <clears throat> it's especially important for the gender issue, but also for parasport. Because in para-sport, in the Paralympics, the whole sporting event could not take place without categorization. Paralympic sport presupposes classification. All para-athletes have to submit to a classification. So again, we have to have categorization in sport. Now, here's the point. We only have categories because we want them. 
So weight is a category in boxing. We have weight categories in boxing only because it's thought desirable to separate boxers according to weight. Uh, if we didn't have weight categories in boxing, the big guys would probably win most contests. So why do we have categories in boxing, weight categories? Because we want to give a good, an opportunity for more people to be champions and winners and therefore have more people participating in the sport. So the rationale for the weight category in boxing is maximum inclusion. Okay, uh, if you didn't want a weight category in boxing, uh, you don't have to have it. Or if you don't like the present categories, you could also su you always suggest different cat categories, right? You can always abolish or revise the categories. And you might propose a new category. You know, I'm a short guy, but I always liked basketball. But I'd never be any good at basketball because I'm not tall enough. So let me, let me say what I want to do with basketball. I think basketball should have a height category. If you're above two meters, that's okay. But if you're below two meters, there should be a separate group. And maybe another separate group below, below 175, because I'm 172. Okay. So if you had height categories in basketball, you would have more people playing basketball. So that's what categorization is for. <clears throat> now, the problem with categories is whatever category you want, it will give you a problem. There are different ways of cheating in sports, uh, depending upon the category. And many athletes deceptively seek to be included in a more advantageous category for themselves. So for example, if you have weight categories in your sport, it gives you a problem. Diuretic doping, for example. If you have age categories in your sport... Извините, Джим Перри, у вас одна минута осталась. You've got only one more minute to go. Only one minute. That's fine, that's fine. Спасибо. If you have an age category in your sport, you have age falsification. If you have a disability categories, you have intentional misrepresentation of your abilities. And so, if you want a category, it requires you to enforce it. But all categories require uh, enforcement. Now, claims for social inclusion are often thought to apply very simply to sport. Sport should be inclusive. My line is, no, it doesn't need to be inclusive. Sport does not need to be inclusive in that sense because nobody's human right to sport is denied if you're excluded from a particular category. No one has a right to inclusion. I'm excluded from under 18s, under 19s football. So what? Doesn't matter. I'm not eligible. And so anybody who's ineligible for a subcategory is excluded in this limited sense. So I'm in favor of categories. I think they're good for sport, but every category raises a problem. But the problem it raises is not a problem of social justice. It's a problem of eligibility. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Questions, please. If there are any questions. I have a question. Uh, sir, you've tackled upon rather challenging subject matter. Uh, tell me something. 
Are there any research and studies on the way which refer to the uh, aspirations on gender principle uh, when uh, females are striving to participate in male sport? Have you studied that? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, because nearly all the studies are on on male to female transitions. That's to say, most of the research, I would say 95% of the research is done on trans women. Now, you raise the issue of trans men. Has there been any research? Very, very little. And the main reason is, I think, that it's trans women who are perceived to have an advantage. Whereas a female transitioning to the male category is perceived to have no advantage. So the problem seems to be on one side only. Thank you very much. And uh, we're not going to hurt our pretty ladies uh, so that they would be striving uh, to turn from fair sex to muscular, uh, tough guys. Thank you for a very fascinating presentation. We carry on with our uh, meeting. Thank you so much. We get down to the next speaker. Vladislav Stolerov, All Russian Scientific Research Institute of Physical Culture and Sports, Moscow, Doctor of Philosophy, Professor. Uh, topical issues of, of uh, relationships of Russia in new political conditions, uh, uh, the attitude in Russia towards diversity of sports movements. I would like to share my screen of Vladislav, 10 minutes. I thought You'd be more generous about time, but I'll try. Thank you. We appreciate. I thought it would be 20 minutes. Well, OK, as you say. So, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to articulate main bullet points uh, about the challenges I'm going to highlight in my presentation. Can you move my slides? So, nowadays, mindful of no social and political conditions and the concepts of multipolar world, great changes are underway in relation to Russia since the standpoint of main aspects of international economics, among other things. Mindful of the situation, it will be necessary to reconsider the attitudes in Russia towards other forms of life and Russia attitude towards sport. It's very important to embark upon the discussions of most acute problems related to retrofitting of relations and attitudes in Russia, uh, mindful of the new concept of multipolar world. Uh, so um, I will try to formulate, uh, formulate some of these uh, themes uh, which are listed here um, on the slide. So first of all, um, I would like to touch upon the following issue, attitude of Russia to the new situation, namely uh, to the Olympic movement. 
So the attempts to discuss this particular issue of the attitude of Russia to the Olympic movement are uh, being taken, but what uh, are they limited to? Well, of course, they're all limited to the possibility uh, to the chance uh, uh, the, 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 uh, of, for Russian um, athletes to take part in the Olympic Games under different conditions. And uh, um, these are uh, discussions that we can uh, listen to every day on TV. But this is not the main problem, as I see it. I think then if we take the issue of uh, the Russia's attitude to the Olympic movement, we should differentiate different aspects of the problem and connect the solution with the fundamental changes in the world. The first aspect of the problem has already been touched upon earlier, but then somehow it lost its uh, topicality. But it seems to me that it is of great importance now Again, I'm talking about the attitude of Russia to the model of the Olympic Games, which you can find in the um, uh, uh, concept by Kuberten. Many b say that it's uh, outdated, but at the same time, in the Olympic Charter, and in the uh, words of the uh, uh, functionaries, it is said that the movement is um, actually being um, orientated at the Kubertens concept. Now, uh, with all of that, the concept is being distorted all the time. It is very important to understand that his purpose not only to revive the Olympic Games, and that's what is being ascribed to him, but the use of the Olympic Games for the main idea, to create a system of the bringing up and education of the physically and emotionally developed individual. And Kubertin spoke about the contradictory impact of sports with all of that. He believed that for a harmoniously developed individual, not every sport is needed, but the sports that is noble, uh, that is um, associated with the ideas of education. That's the kind of sports that he was reviving. Uh, he emphasized that Olympic Games were not just international competitions of the strongest athletes. The whole concept of the present-day Olympic Games is focused on that. Uh, but he believed that those competitions uh, should be positive examples of uh, uh, competition, uh, of noble competition, and developed a whole program for the implementation of the idea. But his ideas were not properly understood, were not properly implemented, and he wrote about that many times. So in 1925, Kubertin left the uh, Nash, uh, the, the uh, International Olympic Committee. So, so the ideas of Kubertin are not outdated at all. Moreover, with the spread of negative trends in sports, his ideas are even more important, even more topical than in the past, particularly um, if we um, take those problems that he raised. The, he spoke about the uh, sports movement. Um, on the basis of the uh, potential, positive potential of the sports, the exclusion of the negative impact of competition in sports. But this problem seems to be out of the focus of attention of the official sports uh, um, uh, policy in Russia and elsewhere. The second aspect, the assessment of the model um, of uh, the, the Olympic movement that we can find in connection with commercialization. The Olympic movement is a sp uh, sporty and commercial. The Olympic sports is a sphere of commercial um, activity. And the games, uh, that's a show that makes it possible to earn a lot of money. So the Olympic movement actually is carrying out the same function as other forms of uh, show business, including circus. So uh, this particular form of Olympic movement, does it have importance for Russia when answering this question? Usually, um, uh, they say that it's adequate and uh, the present days of uh, the economic development, it carries out important functions and it's a sphere of professional activity. It's um, uh, quite entertaining, attracts the best uh, athletes. And well, of course, we should remember and consider these positive functions, but at the same time, um, uh, and that's what I'm talking about in all, my publica in all of my publications, it's um, erroneous to ascribe to the Olympic movement of today the humanistic mission, although this is being done by the functionaries of this movement and some of the researchers. Moreover, some of the functions of the leaking base, for example, um, the 
the, the possibility of finding out the strongest athletes, and this function is carried out by other international competitions. Then the third aspect um, is associated with the negative content of the Olympic Games, commercialization of the professional Olympic sports uh, not only makes the uh, coaches and uh, athletes orient get oriented at uh, profit, but there is also corruption within that movement, uh, unfair judgment, uh, the use of uh, uh, sports in uh, <clears throat> Um, political purposes, and uh, um, they, they, and I would like to emphasize that, and uh, uh, I wrote about it many times. So actually, the process of the transformation of the Olympic Games has been completed, and as a result of this process, these uh, <coughs> games, as compared to the uh, massive sports, could you could you? Uh, a bit slower. But the problems are very uh, complex. Try to be a little bit slower, but because for simultaneous interpreting, it's very important. So, so yes, what is it? So a very important conclusion I would like to repeat that I um, come up with in, more, in all of my publications. So practically, we have come to the end of the transformation, um, uh, uh, to the end of the transformation process of the Olympic Games. So that uh, Olympic Games, as compared to other international competitions, are not positive any longer. But there is a rather negative example of competition in sports. So that means that these games cannot be assessed positively in the system of this sports politics of the country. And this is obvious, particularly in connection with the latest events when the games are, um, are actually being used for the anti-Russian propaganda instigation. So another problem associated with analysis of another important issue, the uh, the particular sports or sports movement that should be uh, a priority form in the structure of the sports policy of our country. This issue has been raised many times in our country and in many other countries. For example, these are discussions on the priority of the mass uh, sports, uh, sports for all, or the sports of high achievements. So uh, this is even more topical nowadays, and this particular issue is being <clears throat> um, um, uh, smoke screened. Uh, smoke screened because a lot is being said about the sports of high achievements and uh, it acquires functions of the sports for all, believing that this particular form of sport helps um, uh, uh, people get stronger. But look at the range of diseases that the athletes in that particular group have. What are the criteria that we should rely on when deciding on the priority of this or that particular sports or sports movement? It seems to me that there are two criteria, two ba basic criteria. First of all, it's the compliance with the national goals of development of the country country and then priority values of the uh, majority of the population. So what are the priority values? What are the purposes of the development of the country? In all the documents, in all the presidential decrees, we, uh, first of all, come across health. Health. So for example, uh, the strategy of the development uh, and education. Um, in different official documents is associated with the moral values, spiritual values, uh, um, uh, fair, uh, uh, fairness, justice. And so this makes it possible for us to understand what the priorities should be and what particular forms of sports uh, uh, should be in focus, because the ones that are focused on uh, show business, that's a different group. Then the orientation at the values of the population. Let's look at that particular issue. What is the percentage of the population orientated at the high achievements in sport. Now, uh, these numbers are not well known at all. They're actually um, uh, covered up. Just 2% of the population are oriented, uh, oriented at high achievements in sport. The others are interested in recreation, leisure time, and health. And then another issue. Uh, I really would like to uh, mention it. So. Um, now, the following um, problem or issue. It's well known that 
when discussing uh, the new uh, world order based on uh, multipolarity, first of all, it was emphasized how important it is to put the end to the domination of the United States in the system of political relations and its impact on all the aspects of life in the world. But it seems to me that with all of that, we also need to discuss uh, the principles of multipolarity in all the spheres of the society life, including sports. And that's what I'm talking about, because this problem has two aspects. First of all, even in the past, in the publications, attention was being paid um, uh, to the domination of Olympic Games in sports as um, compared to the uh, sports that are not included into the Olympic uh, Games. That means the state um, uh, provides financial support to those sports, but the other sports are um, uh, being funded on the principle of residual funding. So this is not the only important thing. These uh, sports included into the Olympic Games they are orientated at uh, the values of the Western culture. And um, that's why the national sports are not developing properly, because the national sports, the national games, are getting unified. And uh, um, uh, some of the researchers, I can mention names and names, because I'm very well familiar with the publications, they um, are indicating uh, these specific feature of the Olympic movement, uh, speak about cultural hegemony. Uh, so it's a very important issue. This is the issue that we should pay attention to. And the, uh, another aspect um, um, uh, associated with the uh, multipolarity of the world, uh, it's the issue of the uh, domination of the Olympic movement as compared to other types of sports movement. Uh, after the uh, uh, failure of the humanic function, humanistic function of the Olympic uh, movement, there began to get formed different uh, um, uh, other uh, forms of movement, sports for all, uh, 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 sports for the development of new games and new sports, and they began to develop. They're much more humane. But uh, first of all, all the focus of attention is on the Olympic movement, uh, in spite of all the negative aspects I have already mentioned. I'm coming to the end of my presentation, so it seems to me the time has come to discuss this issue, and the initiator uh, here, um, um, the, 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 the topic of the priority and the domination of the Olympic movement within the system of the sports movement today could be the association of multi-sports in Russia. Uh, this association does exist, and this activity, for some reason, is not that well known. And um, I would like to draw your attention of the Congress and everyone who is present here to that. It seems to me that time has come uh, to um, uh, to draft and to plan an international congress of sports movements, not of the Olympic movement, but international congress of sports movements, in order to discuss the new system of uh, sports at the international arena um, um, in a much more just and fair way um, with the a proper structure reflecting the changes in the multipolar world. Um, must apologize for uh, speaking that fast, but while well, just trying to fit into the time allocated for me. Thank you very much. If there are questions, you are welcome with questions. Questions? Well, if I may, uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you raised very serious issues, but oh, yes, the, 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 these issues are not even being discussed. So let me uh, say a few words about such negative things as doping, corruption in sports. So we have um, at the university, at, Le at the Lesgoft University uh, department that works on the improvement uh, of the norms of uh, 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 international law in sports. And we already have some draft documents, uh, the draft uh, document for the anti-doping code of the Russian Federation. And it seems to us that uh, these negative phenomena 
um, uh, can be minimized only, only uh, if and when we have the sports law as a separate branch of law, and uh, only when we have the proper sports code of the Russian Federation. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Well, partially, yes. The problem of doping, as I see it, and this is not just my opinion, uh, it's a very difficult problem. It's practically impossible to be re resolved. Uh, we're afraid that um, uh, it's going to be replaced um, with uh, the athletes being made from um, tubes. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, our next participant, Natalia Sergeyevna, are you with us? Uh, Natalia Shumova, uh, candidate of psychology, associate professor, uh, Russian Sports University, Mos Moscow. Good afternoon. Low level of the development of the intellect of uh, uh, Chinese basketball players as a result of frustration and the lower norms of conduct. You have just 10 minutes. I hope you can see my presentation. Can you see it? So, my presentation is uh, dedicated to this uh, theme that has already been um, announced. Uh, the topicality of this work is associated with the necessity to develop the intellectual abilities of the sports so that uh, um, uh, the um, goals set uh, are properly achieved and are approved. Uh, the mistakes in the training um, um, made it uh, much more difficult to achieve these goals and make uh, um, uh, them actually suspicious. About 30 basketball plays from the Beijing Sports University to class in their study. Uh, the age group is 18 to 22 from 5 to 15 years of practice, and the qualification is the first uh, adult regime. The professional group, group number one of the Beijing uh, Sports University, and, uh, the mostly male. And uh, um, uh, the second group is the reserve group and uh, the, the Beijing University. The methods of the study are re represented here on the slide. Now, the study showed the presence uh, of differences um, out of the 39 indicators that we used to compare the two groups. And the reliable differences uh, were associated with six indicators, um, 15 of plus 5 percent. You can find them here um, on the, uh, in the table. We analyze the differences. Let's analyze the differences in detail. So the first difference between the players um, in these two groups is the um, uh, difference in the um, um, mental strain, because um, we show that um, it's lower in the second group because their demands are less strenuous in, on that second group than on the first group. The second difference, reliable difference, is the level of the intellect. The overall level um, in the group, um, uh, in the second group, is uh, uh, much lower. The 7 out of uh, 15 show the level of intellect is less than 4, uh, which uh, indicates that there is a certain rigidity of thinking, that it is difficult for them to resolve some abstract uh, problems, and uh, um, they are not that ready for education and training. And the verbal culture is lower. Uh, the main group, uh, uh, the uh, low level uh, 4, was uh, found in 7% of players. 
The next difference is uh, uh, the uh, behavior. The um, average um, uh, level here uh, is uh, P0.77.3. Uh, That's the average. And uh, so we can see that this data indicates that although the players of the main group are much more industrious, stable, well balanced, and persistent, uh, and uh, tend to moralize and uh, so on, but they um, uh, also have a very well developed sense of uh, re responsibility and they follow the norms. And uh, so they should strive to obtain the goals. Uh, but those who are in the secondary spell, uh, team, they might avoid rules because uh, in line with the rules, they cannot achieve the advantageous result they are striving to. Another difference about being suspicious, uh, they might be suspicious sometimes uh, as to the major team is 3.5. Four uh, percent, and there is a big difference, uh, which is 6.4 uh, percent. That's the suspicion, which is much higher in the second uh, team. They are more egalitarian, they are more egoistic and egocentric, uh, and they are very apprehensive when someone is uh, going to tell them something which is opposed to what they think about themselves. And also, maybe sometimes it's not the highest IQ, the highest level of the intellect among them, so they are not supported enough, uh, and they have to take care of their own interests, and their egoism only grows. Uh, and of course, people surrounding them could find out what they're doing, and they might be punished because they break the rules. That makes them even more suspicious and apprehensive. That is why they are apt to, to shirk the responsibility to, to say that someone else is re responsible for their own mistakes. So that's the difference between the main uh, team and the secondary team as to the ego tension, uh, it's uh, different in both uh, teams. It's a lot. Uh, the apprehension, the tension, uh, the, uh, the suspicion, negative uh, emotions are very high uh, in more than 70% uh, of all uh, the players in the second team. Uh, and when it comes to apathy, low motivation, uh, they are found in four out of 15 basketball players, or 27% in the main uh, team. But we can uh, say that uh, the players in the second team, uh, they are sometimes uh, apprehensive pretty often in 47% only, almost 50% of the players uh, demonstrated that. And in the second team, uh, Oftentimes, uh, could situations evolve uh, when uh, intellectually they are inconsistent, they are in the state of frustration and uncertainty, and that might evoke aggression in them. There could be even typological somatic disorders in them. And the level of excitation due to a high level of dissatisfaction is very high in the players of the secondary team. That way, uh, they might be indicative of the reduction of social status of the group and a much more inferior sports uh, results. Uh, in most part, this is due to the errors in the training uh, when 
the development of intellect is sometimes uh, uh, overlooked, but this is very important as well. And uh, mindful of the previous presentation, I can say that there is a market economy which is around us, uh, and of course the winner gets huge uh, honorary huge money and they are considered to be thriving they are considered to be very successful people so this is one of the predominant ideas because it's based on market economy but achievements should be sustainable uh, it's not to be tolerated when life and health of athletes is at risk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia, for a very interesting presentation. Very good experimental work was done. So you did those diagnostics. What are your recommendations for the coaches uh, for development of the intellect uh, of the basketball players. We have got suggestions, we have got some ideas, we have got methodological recommendations uh, for training uh, basketball players. A team of authors has been doing that and uh, we provide for lots of information like simulation of different uh, game uh, situation for players uh, and then we debrief those situations. Where can we find those methodological recommendations? Uh, at our chair, sort of post session we have it. So I'm going to see them. We'll be very, very glad. Are there more questions for Natalia? Natalia, thank you very much for your presentation. And we're hopeful that your practical recommendations would be very helpful for coaches when it comes to the development of psychological and mental functions of our basketball players. Next presentation. We're moving on. Next one, uh, India. Uh, Mr. Jatin Kumar Soni, India. The presentation will be about the uh, spirituality and ethical moral values via sports. Indian Mythos Professor, are you connected? Yes. Ten minutes. University. My today's topic is attainment of spirituality and ethical values through sports as per the Indian method. Sports is a holy occupation that provides pure entertainment. It should be for social upliftment, social service and certified activity for well-being of human. But when it is taken as a profiting profession, it ruins the players and they develop attitude inclining towards the monetary gain. They make a use of synthetic and harmful drug and the harm there temple somebody bestowed by the God. Such attitude lead both the player and the society toward the deterioration. In order to develop positive attitude and strive a clear from each devil, it is imperative to understand how sports inculcate spiritual outlook in the masses. Sports and game fundamentally strive to bring out the best from us and it helped to achieve higher goal by developing one's physical competence through systematic training. Sports help in build a character, developing personality and attaining self-esteem. It provide healthy physic and sportsman spirit. It teaches a value of healthy competition and perseverance 
all the abide by the rules sports first of value like friendship and brotherlyhood as per lord krishna while reading gita in the light of candle a number of insect get burned in the fire of that candle it is therefore seen that some kind of scene is always attached with each other and every action but those who act selflessly do not get the fruit of such scenes as they are working for the welfare of others and doing selfless action give divine pleasure and lead toward the emancipation teachers and coaches should allow should follow this principle and selfless action and strive the duty of guiding children instead of saying this is not my subject or this is not my work he or she should think that he or she is confident that even a little contribution made by him or her in the creating healthy society will definitely give a greater benefit to the future generation a spiritual outlook at sports shall bring a following points into consideration sports should be for the social upliftment sports should be for the social prestige sports should be for the physical health sports should be for the psychological and sociological development sports should be for the transformation of man into the greater being sports should be only nurturing sportsman spirit sports should be for the respect to others winning or losing should be only a part of the game sports should be inseparable part of the life in which there should be nothing but pure entertainment such arrangement should made that pure entertainment and satisfaction can be derived from sports and it is very important some of the suggestions to sustain spirituality and ethical value in sports that is follows creating a just a strong and healthy atmosphere imparting scientific and systematic training without harming anyone developing socially accepted and just training method for honing skill in the children use only a natural strength and prohibition of use of harmful drugs achieving excellence in sports not at the cost of physical fitness or any illness administering strict and refined rules for sports and games and emulation by the coaches and team learning to respect others it's very necessary in all the aspects of the sports developing and maintaining an attitude of achieving excellence not by violence but by the competence achievement of the player are transitory therefore instead of having the egoism but that a particular player is only one who can perform the best one should think that one's achievement are result of specific circumstances specific time it one must be realized that there are other who are equally talented and they can win rather than me there is a virtue of considering others to be a better or equal should be targeted taught to one duration of training during the training the mindset efforts should be a made toward the nurturing moral and spiritual value in sports special policies should be made to bring about the same within us an element of almighty so we all are a, a god we can our soul 
and so it is a, a true and respect to all human being around us therefore we should respect our competitors our companion as well as other player other athlete other opponent we should have a fruit in ourselves faith in ourselves as well as in others the player should have faith on the teacher mentor coaches and respect him and take a guidance with the right path such value make one's progress towards the morality and spirituality very easier when the sportsman search the immortal soul residing in the mortal body through the medium of sports and through the sports such an atmosphere is created that the player enjoy heavenly happiness and relish not in egoism egotism but a self esteem then and then only we can afford shade philosophy can materialized six point should be uh, reinforced in sports with positive mental emotional physical and social and rational attribute sports person get social recognition and reputation through sports their family gets social reputation and respect sports help in attaining of the social reputation and recognition with the view to hone their skill and competence and the excelling in their respect of game sports person strive for the achieving physical fitness and physical competence as a result of regularity and punctuality in sports it become an integral part of our life so no sports no life it can be sustained some value like self discipline self control sportsman spirit development then by participating in sports this value plays important role in inculcating noble value in their life Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, otherwise, we get down to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your presentation. There are no questions. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. We'll be happy to see you um, during the next Congress. Uh, um, uh, professor of the St. Petersburg University, uh, Dmitry Gavra, will uh, speak about the uh, uh, military metaphor uh, in the uh, contemporary media discourse. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Uh, happy to see you here face to face. And uh, within 10 minutes, uh, we'll be able to discuss how the big sport uh, is uh, carrying out its uh, political function. Its political function. And uh, within the framework of media presentation. Now, first of all, uh, some basic uh, um, um, elements of how we measured that, and then I will describe a specific case uh, and demonstrate um, uh, demonstrate how indeed sport as a surrogate of war um, find its place in media space. Surrogate, surrogate. Yes, yes. That's, uh, uh, that's what's been said by one of the sociologists in sports. He said that in the contemporary world, tolerant world, so to say, sport is a surrogate of war. Um, and, uh, moreover, we decided to... So, we took a case which... Um, um, uh, is a contact sport. 
Right. Let's remember art and metaphor. Now, let's what I'm uh, a candidate uh, 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 to a master's degree in sports in hockey. What were we saying when coming out to the uh, arena? So the, the, it's the fight that is being led by the um, team. That, but we decided to take figure skating as an example. And uh, uh, so the media field, the media field, makes it possible for the sport to not to be just business, but uh, and the, not just the sphere in which we find about the goals, about the uh, time and seconds. But uh, we are in the m metaphoric field. That's us and them, ours and theirs, and there. They begin to work the classical schemes of the mental, mental uh, opposition. In sports, all this works better than elsewhere. Well, in art, yes, it also works quite well. So uh, here is what I'm speaking about. The sports sphere is uh, obviously being transported to politics because the winner is just one, and then there is ours and there is theirs, and there are principles that go beyond the Olympic ideals that we listen to already, and then the, our Indian uh, colleagues spoke about the normative understanding of the sport functions, and we spoke about the ideals of Pierre de Coubertin. But the matter is that, let's remember what uh, Clausewitz used to say. He used to say that war is the continuation of the um, uh, uh, politics. So it's the total cognitive war today um, uh, is everywhere in all the fields, and the field of sport is one of the major fields within the framework of which the principles of cognitive war um, are manifested. Uh, the look at the level of mental pressure on the behavior and on the uh, consciousness of those who are involved. So uh, here is uh, Sun Zin, uh, the, uh, uh, the, his book, The Art of War. Let's look at the example with the doping test of Kamila Valieva. We selected the the empiric base database was collected uh, from the media uh, in uh, Great Britain and the United States, Russia, Germany, and um, uh, from a country that loves Russia, as you know, Poland. The way they reflected the situation, the way they described what happened, uh, described the doping tests uh, of Aleva. So. Uh, Sunzi uh, says, um, uh, disintegrate everything positive uh, in uh, in the camp of the enemy. That's what happens with the figure skating. In, include the major um, active uh, activists into the discussion. And we can see what is happening in social media. We can see that they write about the doping scandal. Undermine the prestige of the leadership. Yes, um, uh, once. We accept the fact, the unproven fact of the uh, positive test. They further on in the American, in the British, German, and Polish discourse, they uh, actually um, uh, began to continue this building of that. Uh, Terry Tudberidze as the coach, and then they moved upwards to the leaders of the Russian sports and all the way up to the president. That's how it works. Undermine the moral state of the um, competitor. So revision of the um, ideas of the, of the plans to award the medals and so on and so on. To remember uh, the uh, uh, a pair of ours uh, who were actually um, winners together with the Canadian uh, 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 pair. And uh, they were on the same step, on the same level as the Canadians, but they were the second at the same time. They stepped up being second. Then devalue uh, the uh, tradition. Um, Tchaikovsky instead of the hymn of the country. All these stories are within their description. Cognitive war uh, following Sunzi. And then um, be generous when buying information from the um, uh, uh, from those uh, uh, together with them. So the brief 
uh, description of the case. You all remember what it what happened and how it was. Let's look at the empirical database, and uh, uh, I'm just demonstrating it uh, in, for you to know how much we have done. And here is another question, how the Russian media marked this particular incident. For us, uh, this case is quite interesting, since it was the Beijing Olympic Games. Uh, uh, the special military operation had not started yet. That means that following the um, Western media, we had a classical case of zero option. Uh, Russia at that time um, was not an aggressor yet, according to their opinion. We were so participating in the Olympic Games under the flag of the Olymp Olympic um, Committee. But all the signs of the war were there at the same time. Let's look at uh, uh, the media and the way the Russian media worked. And our hypothesis here indicates that in the Russian media disc discourse, uh, journalists and the um, leaders of the team and media persons and bloggers, uh, they all used uh, uh, the, uh, their response to aggression. They use these words, a battle, a fight, and you know what is discursive power? According to Foucault, it's the power which is formed by the basic system of notions and categories, and the screen describes that directly. But uh, are you, uh, uh, and what is the basic law of the cognitive war? Uh, uh, truth. Truth is what people believe in. It's not what uh, is there in reality, but that's what people believe in. And the ambivalent situation, the fair war, is the war on the side of the one who proves that it is fair. And that's exactly what our um, uh, um, uh, enemies um, uh, proceeded from in case of Kamila Valeva and uh, Russian uh, um, media field, yes. Again, um, uh, Camilla will win the gold medal, win, um, will uh, the battle, fight, combat. Uh, the uh, girls are there skating with music, and we read decisive battle. So these are the things that are very strong, and that they, they form part of your understanding. Uh, the uh, powerful enemies, uh, opponents, and uh, uh, then the image of Camilla Cam Valeva. Initially, uh, it was um, um, uh, well. She was uh, she was um, a hostage. Um, uh, something in the terms of uh, Rus surrender. That's uh, the media space turns into an, a weapon. A weapon. Um, changing the mental perception of the situation. What are the conclusions? What were we able uh, to get as a result of this case and other cases? The cognitive war as a new form of war um, is uh, um, carried out at all fronts. The cognitive war in the field of sport is one of the most uh, severe but well understood to um, uh, common people, fields of battle. And sport, no matter what we say, what we speak about na narrative, what we speak about uh, peace and uh, cooperation uh, in the context of sport, but sport will always be the field of uh, um, battle-like opposition. So that means there will be no peace in the heads of the people in this sense, and there will be no ever any peace in the heads of the people in this sense. That means we need to protect our own in the media field, in the real field, and yeah, we must be there, ready to understand that after this presentation, we would uh, rather go to the humanitarian component of sport, Sport, you are peace. That's what Pierre de Coubertin used to say. And we remember his words. And after this presentation, I, I really would like to uh, juxtapose um, war and sport. It seems to me that humanitarian 
and humane um, content of uh, uh, in, in sport is much stronger than the uh, military one. So in the social sense, we should not really uh, put forward uh, the idea of sports and war. Uh, going hand in hand. But as a scientific theme, it is there. Of course, it has a right to be exist, to be in place and to be discussed. But I really don't want it to develop like that. Microphone. No, I agree with you absolutely. Yes, the humanistic meaning of sport, the philosophy of sport, exclude everything that is connected with the negation of individuals and the quality of people and the quality of opportunities. But uh, the matter is that, unfortunately, we are examining social factors, and the social factors show that this field is occupied, unfortunately, occupied by those who are waging war. And it is quite obvious that if against us, against our country, against our ideology, the war is being waged, then we cannot ne neglect it, and we can not allow ourselves not to respond to it. You're absolutely right. Sport is about something very different. What I'm talking to you about, that's my profession, cognitive confrontation, protection against uh, mental and psychological aggression. But um, in sport, we can see it quite clearly, even uh, if there is a confrontation at different levels. Any other questions to the speaker? Allow me to add a few words. Uh, in the morning, we spoke about uh, sports diplomacy and law. And there they told us that uh, sports uh, law is soft law, and that the norms of sports diplomacy should be spread over all the issues of sports regulation. So uh, this uh, particular motto that you know, there is no peace in the heads of the people, and there can be no peace. So this is a, a soft escalation of all of that. And uh, uh, the situation with Valia and with other athletes and doping. Now, that is um, quite an interesting topic. Um, um, in Lesgaft University, we have an anti-doping laboratory, and we are uh, examining foreign legislation pertaining to that, and they have already integrated the norms of VADA. And we work on the draft uh, code for the Russian Federation, anti-doping code. So we're trying to integrate this issue into the uh, legislation of Russia for our athletes to be protected. But time is needed for that. From the point of view of science, I would agree uh, with Ludmila. Uh, uh, we can look at this as an element of science, yes, as a trend in science, yes. Yes, a trend, trend, uh, yes. All right, yes. Uh, philosophers speak about that. Uh, people, uh, yes, uh, tend to rely on metaphors. That's what Nietzsche used to write about. They want things to be brighter, brilliant, as in the uh, dream, multicolored dream. But at the Congress today, if we look at this matter, I think that we should um, refer to sports diplomacy quite recently. Uh, we had a conference, Sports and Peace. And a colleague of mine, Hassan, invited a lot of uh, researchers uh, um, to take part in the conference. Many from the Arabic world came. This conference is being arranged from year to year. And we can see in reality that uh, this position, this thesis, Sport, You Are Peace, um, uh, it, um, uh, it is, um, we can find it. It is much more realistic than what uh, we're discussing now. And the, uh, I'm addressing the audience now concerning the social function, which is one of the, one of the most important functions of the sport. It's peacekeeping function, and peacemaking function. And let's be positive and move towards the development of this particular trend and this particular thesis. I think this is more constructive and more interesting. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, that was most interesting indeed. Yeah, allow me to 
say a few words. Everything that you are saying about sports and about uh, uh, Russian um, sportsmen and their problems, it's all true. But uh, uh, I do believe that uh, 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 here, we shouldn't use this particular language. We should uh, avoid uh, it uh, because uh, many others uh, will believe that uh, uh, that this is propaganda, that we are um, focusing on war. No, we don't want it. No. Uh, 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 um, uh, accept my apologies, and uh, I would like to support uh, Dmitry Gavra. Uh, it seems to me that he was not, um, um, uh, he, he expressed his concern with the problem. Uh, his presentation was not a propaganda in Wendy, and he referred to Senzin. And uh, so the, ideas, uh, the idea of Senzin, the destruction of the state, starts uh, uh, from within. Um, um, and the external forces are just adding up anything to it. Your study probably would have been even more interesting with that particular twist towards the internal forces. And um, the main idea of sport um, uh, as a symbol of peace uh, uh, is there, but this is the, the um, noble uh, idea. And we're trying to find its implementation today, considering the problems of its achievement. Thank you. Oh, dear colleagues, we continue. And the next uh, speaker is Vera Kuznetsova. Are you here with us? National State University of, uh, uh, of Lesgov University, St. Petersburg. Candidate of Philosophies, Associate Professor. Sports activity as a condition of social survival, cultural and historical aspects. And next, Ninel Yakovlevna. You have 10 minutes. Dear colleagues, dear organizers, I'm happy to see all of you, and I'm happy to suggest um, our presentation to you, which is dedicated to this um, uh, theme. And right away, I would like to mention that this presentation came um, 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 as a result of uh, um, our critics of uh, Gutmann's idea from uh, ideal to records. Uh, uh, and here in my presentation, we speak about the role of athletism and sports activities in, uh, in different cultural and historical epochs uh, from the point of view of the sociology of survival as a sociological and uh, cultural category. So, um, uh, Goodman um, speaks about sport. Um, he goes back to the um, foundations and to the originals of sport, and we are not an exclusion here. The primary, well, and uh, we may speak about different kinds of human activities, creating that. A cultural, super natural environment. Uh, this is about the perceptions, morphological perceptions of uh, the surroundings. Uh, from our perspective, mythological uh, perceptions uh, identify the specificity of sports activities. This activity is embedded into pagan representations of hunter civilization, whose main postulate is the survival. And one of the conditions of the survival of those ancient times encompassing uh, different ages, nonetheless, it's all about successful hunt. Uh, 
For the hunt to become successful, it's necessary to have a certain exercise, certain training process, which is encompassed uh, by pagan religion and magic. That way, sports activities uh, is sort of eclectic. This is uh, some kind of uh, uh, the outcome of uh, uh, forced uh, accommodation to the situation in which the culture has been existing. Uh, Greek culture opens up new horizons. It unravels new opportunities. Uh, which, but there I go again, I'll have to pronounce this world, word, I will, I mean war. Uh, so uh, there is Greek religion and there are wars, ongoing wars uh, accompanying their whole lives. It's all intertwined. Uh, it all goes hand in hand together. Uh, those things are undetachable, uh, but what is the virtue of a citizen, of a palace? First of all, the participation in political life uh, of the males uh, and protection of the pole. Constant wars require the necessary critical form, and they require training and exercise. It's not possible to detach from that. And it's also necessary to mention the fact that the specificity of pagan religion of ancient Greeks, which uh, under, had undergone a specific pathway, it was reflected in a tropomorphic embodiment of Greek gods. Uh, so what's created is a beautiful ideal image of an athlete everybody should strive towards. I'm here to remind you that as we are all aware of the Olympic go Games, we know that Olympionic uh, is uh, akin to God. He achieves something which is utterly impossible for real human being, and he is playing like a god. He is not laboring. He is not competing. He is a god, but he is mortal, which enables the culture to set the horizons in which a human being made uh, perfect himself and digress uh, from uh, other things, digress from war as the main defining factor for the establishment and development of athleticism and sports activities. Uh, for the first time in the history of mankind, we encounter a secularity of sport and the creation of different uh, structures to train athletes is turned into the source of gain, source of income, because sport is embedded into the fabric of cultural life. Of course, it's related to traditions, it's related to religion, but on the other hand, we obtain this agonality as a cultural grinding of not just bodiness, of the bodily nature, but also of the spiritual nature of a human being. Uh, uh, Christianity is embodied into, in the culture of Middle Ages. That cultural milieu was uh, ever so changing. But in the Middle Ages, wars were ongoing, uh, and human beings had to exist in the culture which enables him or her to have a certain level of physical fitness. Uh, that is, uh, it's embedded uh, into this very fabric of life. Uh, and Goodman 
Uh, so this is about secularity of sports. Some elements are present there, but religious upbringing back in those times is not detached from uh, the physical exercise and physical perfection. They both go hand in hand together. I've been meaning to tell you that politicization of sports in 20th century brings the contemporary sports movement into crisis, and we have been eyewitnessing this crisis and the co-sport in postmodernic society. Different types of co-sport made us conclude that in such conditions the athletism goes into the background and different senses get into the sphere of social, cultural practices and technologies. This optimistic view and optimistic perception which is about the fact that those structures are shaping up a human being uh, to be supported in this form of survival provides them with uh, diverse spheres for self-fulfillment. Thank you. main conclusion of analysis dumb is about the fact that sports activity throughout all the ages and times had made a sense the idea of survival in its sociological and cultural aspect. Thank you, Vera. Are there any questions? How to survive in our times? thing is that, unfortunately, when one encounters what has been going on around us in our times, uh, you become aware that there are some niches evolving for human beings which uh, lead them, let's say, to echo sport or to some extreme activities. Uh, they distract human beings from other things. Uh, they distract people from reality to uh, game. So what can we say about contemporary athletes? When I was uh, talking about Greece, an athlete was a super creature above everything, head and shoulders above everybody else, a hero athlete. And what is an athlete nowadays? A warrior? I wouldn't say that, although metaphors are close to that. A, a butler, a combatant, a fighter, when some see that the body is a fetish, the body is a capital, among other things. Uh, the body is created for other purposes as well. Ad lib, no microphone is used. We can speak about mass sports or high achievement sports, but no time for that. Thank you very much. Historic discourse into the development of sports or sports activities is very fascinating, but we are getting down to the next presentation. We invite Ninel Alessic, St. Petersburg State University, St. Petersburg, uh, Doctor of Historic history professor, uh, topical psychological moral traditions of Russian sport in contemporary conditions. Distinguished sport lovers, uh, 
professionals, uh, scientists, I would like to share with uh, our own studies. I'm not an athlete. I'm a historian, and I am the president of the foundation, famous university alumni. So I would like to tell you a few words about our book. Uh, it's dedicated to the university, and uh, you might get it uh, for free, although the book is quite expensive, but you'll be able to get it for free today. And uh, our presentations were published before, and we had very interesting uh, discussions uh, with uh, uh, some of you, and we visited the forum in Hungary, and we were promoting your publications as well, so we are acquainted. Dear colleagues, uh, I would like to tell you the way uh, traditions of sports were developing in our country, which are still there. Thing is that Russian sport is the sport uh, which is unprecedented and unparalleled. There is nothing like that anywhere in the world. It's unique. That's the way it is, period, because our sport has got very interesting traditions, uh, and we should retain all that amid the current turmoils. Uh, we should support our sport and its existence, enhance the existence of our country. Which traditions are there which are typical for our sports? It's high intellect, uh, high level of education and ardent love for our motherland. In pre-revolutionary Russia, sports and physical exercise was just a diversion and amusement, a recreation. It was hunting duels among the noblemen, but uh, by the end of uh, but in the 20th century, it was real sports revolution. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but nonetheless, everything which ensued after that was about redefinition of the conscience and uh, redefinition of way of life. Uh, mass sport comes along. Uh, it uh, changes many things. Uh, uh, even uh, during the lectures, uh, Professor Lesgov uh, was addressing male and female students already. And female students back then were not just wearing uh, athletic outfits, uh, so it was not quite physically convenient, technically convenient for them to exercise first. Uh, but sport has been changing, no things were coming along, and many great states, statesmen uh, were very good uh, sportsmen, very good athletes, and uh, nowadays is the same tradition. So our university uh, helped them to attain many heights in their life, lots of uh, upscale executive uh, civil servants. Uh, they are well versed in sport and they are physically fit. Prior to that revolution, it was very uh, in, very fashionable to be very skinny with flat chest uh, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, big muscles were testifying to low intellect. That was one of the ideas. Uh, and uh, one of our champions, Pavel Kolomenka, he is our alum. And when he started working, he was shy uh, because he had big muscles. Uh, and also he had to change his family name not to be recognized by everyone. As I say, sport first evolved amid upscale 
state of society among intellectual idea, uh, elite, uh, uh, but uh, then it uh, underpinned all the strata of society. Different sports initiatives were coming up. And our book is telling the story of the development of different kinds of sports. Sport becomes part and parcel of our lives, not just pulling the rope, uh, but many other things. Uh, I'm here to see that sports is a very important factor, even in uh, imperial Russia of 19th and outside of 20th century. It Uh, redefined many minds and many mindsets of people. So it uh, became uh, the issue for uh, the uh, governance uh, and uh, in the imperial times, in the times of Romanov dynasty, sport was developing as well. Then Here comes the revolution, uh, October revolution, and Bolsheviks were saying that sport is uh, the pastime of the aristocracy. We should discard it, but sport was retained. Uh, there were lots of slogans and mottos after the October revolution, the creation of new Uh, man, no human being, uh, the creator of communist uh, society. Physical development, uh, physical fitness was in the center of attention. Uh, so what is happening? Huge, massive parades of athletes in all the cities. There are lots of sculptures of athletes installed in different parks. Uh, there are lots of postcards depicting uh, different athletes. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a painting uh, by Soviet painter Dynaka. And uh, Dynaka painted many posters as well. This is about sport. Uh, everywhere, even the, in the bathrooms, in the toilets, uh, uh, those, there were those posters. In the kettles also that. And uh, one of the slogans was, even if you are not high achievement athlete, you're obliged to go in for sports and to be physical. Fit. But the entire world has got the winning champions in sport, and in the Soviet uh, times, uh, the general idea was uh, that mass sport was very important because we were going to uh, construct the communism. And uh, in the Soviet Union in August, there was uh, the uh, big uh, sports event, event which displayed the fact that we need leaders and we need global athlete leaders. So. We had to redefine our mindsets, uh, uh, not just only sports for all and for everyone, but we needed leaders in sport, leading athletes. Uh, and thanks to those deeply rooted traditions, uh, when broad people's masses were outreached, the idea of the motherland patriotism, uh, protection of our great country, uh, that was important for for the development of our sport, but uh, an understanding came along that new leaders in sport had to be fostered, uh, had to be abroad. And of course, there was value education for the generation they had in the Soviet time, but uh, they started speaking about military, uh, about sports champions, uh, And then in the 20th century, in 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, a Cold War uh, came along, uh, and there were different other symbols and other things came into the lives of athletes, dollars, uh, third currency, 
emigration of the athletes abroad. But I reiterate, Russian sport is most unusual. Traditions are most unusual, unique, and specific. Nothing like that exists in UK or US for that matter, sports like that. And amid the, uh, the toughest years and amid different turmoils, uh, uh, yet, uh, sport was retained. Many athletes emigrated to different countries, and their own children, their siblings, could not speak a single word in Russian even. But nonetheless, sport is still there. To retain the great traditions of Russian sport, love of motherland, uh, um, intellectual uh, approach. We must be intellectuals, and uh, I tried to uh, emphasize that. And to uh, take the university of ours, how many intellectuals has it uh, brought to life? Uh, for the first time at the university, uh, uh, students uh, 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 started uh, going into sports. Uh, it, there was, um, and the ministry of ours um, uh, was uh, uh, on the side of that, and they, they introduced those special classes in physical training. But then they began to spread all over in the city. Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to show this book to you. This book is quite interesting. You will find everything from the entertainment of the Tsar's family and uh, uh, in sports and uh, um, in the uh, contemporary uh, culture. We even have a metro station in the city, Spartivnaya. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested enough, then. Um, Thank you very much for this gift and to, uh, uh, to our foreign um, colleague. And here is my card. If there are questions, I'm most willing to answer them. Remember, I am a historian, not an athlete. That was extremely interesting. And uh, it was interesting to follow the traditions uh, of the uh, Russian sport and to, to see how they exist in the present day. So, Nina Yakovlevna, thank you very much. And our next speaker. Now, yeah, are we, the, the audience was listening to me. That was most important. Thank you. Now, time is limited, unfortunately. The next speaker is Yelena Krotova from the um, uh, National <coughs> Lesgoft University, St. Petersburg. The transformation of aesthetical, aesthetic values in sports. You have 10 minutes. It's not a secret at all that sport now is a, a part of culture and part of the modern society. And sport reflects all the processes that occur in the world and all the values that are typical of this or that community. It's well known that the value system is multifaceted. There's a lot of definitions of it. And let's speak about the um, def definition provided by Kaganov. So it's, uh, um, uh, it's the attitude of human beings, well understood. And the value of this is not the object as such, but it's a meaning that uh, we can see um, that a human being can see in this or that form. And first of all, he indicates, no. The value is a product of human nature. Uh, values are formed in the society, and they depend on the social cultural paradigm. And if we look at the at different classifications, we'll see that in some of them, there are aesthetic values as a separate um, a type of values. And here are some of the examples uh, of the classification. But let's spe uh, speak about the classification provided by uh, uh, Yerasov. Yerasov suggested uh, the, to separate the aesthetic values it's in, as a sixth group, the final group. And uh, it's beauty, ideal, uh, style, harmony, eclectism, following tradition, uh, novel novelty, cultural individuality, or uh, <clears throat> copying of the prestigious uh, fashion. Sport, 
is a, as a carrier of aesthetic values manifested through categories, aesthetic, comic, beautiful. And uh, in sports, there is a hierarchy of aesthetic values based on the basis of the perception of the sports um, and uh, has an impact on the aesthetic perception. But uh, there is a reassessment of these values that we are facing today, and the nominating values are not values any longer. Those values that are being formed with the uh, athletes are being transformed. Not the values so much, but the importance and the perception of the values, rather. And this is happening not for the first time. The cyclic um, approach to the values can be traced through the history of sport. In ancient Greece, the aesthetic value of sport was great. For them, um, competitions were holy, sacred. The place, the time um, were such uh, that uh, th they could glorify the gods. And uh, it was a very important element of the culture of the Greeks. But at the time of Roman civilization, the aesthetic perception of sport changed, as well as all the other values in the society. In place of the um, gods um, or semi-gods of uh, Greece, gladiators came. And so it all degraded to the ugly, and the Greek sport was um, believed to be too feminine. And that historic period, they admired battle in all forms, and violence uh, has uh, the importance of the ones of beauty. And so that was the <clears throat> uh, destruction of um, aesthetic values. At the uh, Postmodernism uh, also um, demonstrates the change of aesthetic systems, and the aesthetic perception is also changing. And so uh, the uh, profit from sports has a negative impact on the aesthetic content of sport. Form is on the, uh, at the forefront instead of content. And uh, the, too much aestheticism associated with sport leads to the situation that So the, the spectators uh, lose the aesthetic taste and the assessment. The objective criteria of beauty are lost. The category of beautiful um, gives place to the secondary elements. The aesthetic joy is provided not by the actions of the athlete, but from the external manifestation of um, uh, the uh, situation, the, the clothing, uh, the muscles, and so on. The transformation of aesthetic values simplifies the perception of sport. The spectator res, consumes the result, not the action, and sport is created by sportsmen, by athletes. And so for the analysis of the importance of the aesthetic elements, we um, spread a questionnaire in order to understand the hierarchy in different types of sports. And the respondents were students of our school of the Lesgift University. So half of the respondents were students um, uh, who are going to the um, acrobatics, aerobics, and uh, g gymnastics. The other half were football, skiing, and um, other sports. And uh, uh, the respondents were to choose the three factors that have an impact on the aesthetics of the uh, sports. And you can see the results here. Analyzing the data following the answers to the first question, we can state the difference between the perception of the aesthetic results of the artistic and non-artisting sports. And the respondents answer the questions on the basis of their own knowledge of their own sports and uh, the way they understand it and perceive it. Students uh, of the art sports uh, perceive the sports uh, um, show from the external form, music, program costumes are important because they have an important impact on them the uh, the uh, outlook of the uh, athlete the dramatic uh, costume the music all this has an impact on the result and so you can see the results the first uh, the, the um, sportsmanship is most important for them uh, for the second group without sportsmanship they won't be able to show the ideally performed program for these athletes the result is uh, um, um, a totality of all these factors and probably the result is the uh, a fact, uh, and it shouldn't have any impact on the aesthetics of sport. The students who are in the second group, the non-artistic group, believe that, first of all, the dra drama of the competition and the struggle are important. Without that, uh, there will be no spectators, and the, it's um, very important uh, for, the sport, for the athletes. Um, 
in the game, the presence of the audience is most important. They're fighting with each other, and so it's important for them to see the reaction of the audience. And the, the first place is taken by the result. Um, uh, records are most important for them. These are the achievements. In the second questionnaire, and the second a question another. The respondents were to arrange uh, the uh, aesthetic elements um, following their meaning, not sport, uh, artistic and non-artistic. Here is the hierarchy provided by the students for different sports, the sports they go in for, and you can see the results here. In the table, you can find the results uh, by three major aesthetic elements, uh, uh, according to their opinion. Thus, we can see that in the artistic sports, uh, among the aesthetic elements, most often we'll see the creative and um, approach and the originality, beautiful figure, um, artistic approach, and uh, the, the possibilities provided by the body. Once again, we can see the same trend here, the trend that I have already described to you. In the non-artistic sports, the situation is somewhat different because the respondents selected the a result, first of all. Uh, these two groups, they uh, uh, do not place the moral um, behavior uh, on the first place. The knowledge of the aesthetic elements is quite limited. Um, in the artistic sports, we can see the trend for maximal um, trend towards art, but as a result, the spectator perceives these uh, sports uh, very superficially. In non-artistic, we can see the trend towards the narrowing down of the aesthetic perception of the competitions. Now, looking at the sports as the digital statistics uh, with focus on the final result, the spectators forget about the aesthetic qualities of sport and forget that each and every movement uh, expresses beauty. The qualification transforms uh, the picture into a result. Thank you very much. Your questions now. A microphone. Microphone, please, we cannot hear. The matter is that uh, artistic and non-artistic, this is uh, uh, not exactly degradation. Uh, this aesthetic and non-aesthetic. There's a trend um, uh, towards aestheticism or the uh, martial laws, uh, artistic and non-artistic. Now, uh, these are the sports uh, which are close enough to art. Gymnastics, figure skating, but it does not mean that the other sports are not aesthetical at all, no. But when uh, we speak about the classification, they just indicate, they, they, they uh, rely on the most important element. In gymnastics and figure skating, the uh, uh, Grades uh, depend very much on the components that are associated with this aesthetics, although this is very conventional. Thank you for your response. And one other question I would like to ask you, and um, your attitude concerning the aesthetic uh, uh, um, aspects of uh, uh, female boxing and uh, no, my attitude to um, women in this uh, sports is positive if this does not go beyond the competitive element. Now, let's, uh, re re we, we admire track and field, but uh, we all remember um, uh, Bolt, um 100 meters, but, uh, but but nobody remembers a woman winning the same distance. As for boxing, we remember men in that box, but we are unable to admire um, women in the same um, sport. Although we should, should these sports be developed? Traditionally male sports for women, for girls, should we, should we promote this among women, among girls, or the aesthetic component of these sports is so low that we shouldn't do it. It seems to me that these sports are to be developed in their own format. Uh, nowadays, quite often, the female uh, sport develops in the political uh, um, f format just to win the competition. So I think so. That it's, it's worth it. So, so we should invite girls 
schoolgirls to take part in wrestling, in uh, football, hockey, ice hockey? Should we popularize these sports, considering the fact that they're mostly developed for uh, getting medals rather than anything else? We as teachers, what should we do? Should we promote that or not? Or do we have a right to doubt? We should, um, in, well, we should make sure that children in sports make their own choice, following the moral pathway, without getting similar to other standards and following other standards and uh, following just um, the pathway of uh, getting awards. Yes, you're welcome. Microphone, please, microphone. Microphone is not on, sorry. Oh, Winner once, Irina Winner once said that the future of, uh, no, of gymnastics is uh, uh, associated with men coming to it. So we should also remember that, considering the for the. So people should have a right to choose. Uh, no, the matter is that the aesthetic or non aesthetic. Uh, it's uh, uh, associated with two categories, the aesthetics of the beautiful and the ugly. But in sports, uh, I can see it's uh, not a matter of sports itself, but the sportsmanship. If the level of sportsmanship in um, the girls playing hockey low, then it's not aesthetic. But in Canada, where they have been playing it for a hundred years, it looks very attractive and it's aesthetic. Anything else? The microphone is not on, so it's impossible to interpret. Sorry. No, um, each of us um, can ex um, accept that uh, in gymnastics, in ballet, um, uh, the, it's no matter whether whether we promote this or not, but you are not going to be in that sport if your parameters are wrong. So, but there are um, so there are some girls who are good enough for other sports, uh, um, uh, for uh, which uh, are probably non-aesthetic, which are male. Uh, Uh, so the, the results um, achieved by some women, by some strong women, um, not the results that a girl in gymnastics can achieve at all, no. So it's not the matter of uh, um, canvassing, really, for this or that particular sport, but it's rather canvassing for uh, the um, possibility to um, realize one's own abilities in that. Because sports is a social lift, and this is something we have not mentioned. And one final question. How are you going to develop that particular topic? As a postgraduate student or in your dissertation, what will you do with it? Uh, so dissertation, sports aesthetics on the whole. As unfortunately, over the past period of time, somehow, uh, this seems to be left out, and um, we can't demonstrate anything new in that. So it's a topical uh, issue indeed, uh, not well investigated. So we'll expect from the dissertation from you. Our next speaker is from China, Chen Yu. You'll speak about the investigation of cultural conflict and intercultural communication at the international sports events. We come from Tianjin University of Sport. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to attend the conference. The topic I'm asked to speak on is Research on the cultural conflicts in the cross-cultural communication of international sport events. My presentation will include these four parts. 
First, the background of our research. Second, the research methods we have proposed in the paper. Third, research results. And the last, some conclusions we have got. The first part of the research, which is the relevant background of the research. In the cross-cultural communication of sports events, cultural conflicts are inevitable because different countries have different cultural backgrounds. And these cultural conflicts have different degrees of influence on sports events. So the purpose of this study is to explore the types of cultural conflicts in the process of cross-cultural communication of sports events, as well as the reasons for their formation, and to propose corresponding solutions. The second part of the report is the research method. This study uses the cases analysis method to interpret the specific cases of cross-cultural communication of sports events. At the same time, it uses the expert interview method to summarize the opinions of industry experts on cultural conflicts. The third part is the research results. We have summed up three types of culture conflicts. The first is culture clashes in sports coverage. The reports here mainly refer to the reports on TV and the newspapers. For example, in the past two years, many European countries have inconsistent views on the Euro Football Super League which is influenced by regional culture. The second is the cultural conflict in the broadcast of sports events. Different countries have different views of broadcasting of sports events. Taking the Winter Olympics as an example, some countries tend to broadcast ice events while others prefer snow events. The third is the cultural conflict in sports event advertisement. The advertisement of sponsors of some major events sometimes cause dissatisfaction in different cultural regions, such as the advertising war between Pepsi and Coca-Cola. These conflicts will have a negative impact on the event itself. The reasons for the formation of cultural conflicts mainly come from three aspects. The first is the difference in cultural background. Each country has its own history and cultural environment, and when watching sports events, it prefers events and athletes from the same cultural circle. The second is a different way of thinking. Different cultural environments lead to different ways of thinking and behavior among people in various countries and regions. Some people focus on the skills of athletes, while others prefer the sports ship. Finally, the value is different. In cross-cultural communication, different values have resulted in different broadcast forms and reporting modes, and finally presented different forms of cultural conflicts. Regarding the impact of cultural conflicts, I think there are two main points. 
The first is that the influence of sports events is reduced, and the second is that sport fans become disgusted and resistant to sports events. In any case, cultural conflicts will have a great negative impact on sports events. The last part is the research conclusion. In the process of broadcasting sports events, Cultural conflicts are unavoidable. People are affected by cultural backgrounds, ways of thinking and values, and have very different understandings of sports events communication, finally lead to various types of conflicts. Therefore, for international sports events, it is possible to enhance cultural exchanges abide by the principles of cultural communication, cultivated more talents and uh, related fields, and help achieve better communication of sports events. That's all for my presentation. If you have any question, please feel free to contact me. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions? Use the microphone, please. Uh, unless there are none. So thank you very much for your participation, first of all, for your engagement. Uh, uh, we uh, think you'll participate in our upcoming Congresses as well. And we are getting down to the next speaker, uh, Victor. Uh, Victor Makenkov, Doctor of Psychology, Professor, National State University of Physical Culture, Sports and Health of Lesgov from St. Petersburg. He'll speak about the impact of social communications upon the formation of Olympic values. Next will be Ksenia Kuprina. Distinguished members of the podium, dear attendees, maybe someone is uh, via internet connected to us. I would like to acknowledge my co-author who could make it here, uh, the PhD in physical mathematical sciences, Dana Mustafeva. Uh, uh, the uh, definition or connotation or notion of values uh, has been uh, repeatedly used here. It can be looked from different positions for religion, for example. When we are reading the Bible, Quran, or Torah, we can see the very basics of those religious uh, schools of thought, philosophical studies. Uh, when we perceive values from this standpoint, it's also about major criteria of the good and the evil, which are considered by many representatives of uh, philosophical school of thought in 17th century. Uh, so Adam Smith uh, uh, wrote his uh, famous uh, treatise. He was speaking about the reason and causes of the wealth, uh, the theory of reasonable egoism. And of course, cultural values are very important. It was 1954 when the Hay Convention uh, corroborated and endorsed the definition uh, a notion of cultural values. For us, it's very indifferent. To, uh, it's very important to trace this interconnection, interrelationship. Uh, based on that, we uh, put together our own approach towards Olympic values, which has been repeatedly mentioned here today. It's extremely important. to say that Olympic values are about identifying the winner in a fair play among the best uh, athletes, sport 
is to support the model of uh, resolution of conflicts. The conflicts are encountered by human beings every step of the way in their lives. So it's very important to transit sports values onto other kinds of man's activities. But we are aware that the development of approaches towards those values uh, Uh, mindful of Baron Pierre de Coubertin, what he said, Coubertin perceived the sports and Olympic Games uh, not an end in itself, but just the goal uh, to develop human personality. Now many things have been changing, and we have to study the current state of affairs of the Olympic movement, mindful of the modernity, social, psychological implications are important. We have to identify the interrelationship between values, needs, and motives. Uh, values are exercising the regulatory function in assessment of different events. And uh, they compare the desirable and uh, the real state. Uh, cognitive structure and cognit is our knowledge about those values. We should carry through with what we call Olympic education. Motivational need sphere is uh, triggered uh, via uh, overcoming the threshold between the needs and uh, the uh, real actions. If we step over this uh, threshold, uh, then we are aspiring to reach more and more goals. Uh, from our perspective, the system of values is well represented in Rockage theory. It's indicated here in the slide. And uh, I would like to underscore the fact that the total number of those values is not uh, as uh, large as we think. Many people possess the same values. Another thing is that the values are structured within a certain kind of hierarchy. Rokic was saying that uh, there could be values of means and values of uh, you know, goals, terminal or instrumental values, in other words. As to the structure and direction of the values, I am here to say that we can find the nucleus or the core of the values, uh, which is typical for its stability and the periphery of those values, which is permanent and uh, a changing uh, versus the nucleus of the values. As to the direction of those values, is the direction towards openness uh, and a desire for change. Innovators are very important. They implement those changes. They are in the minority, of course. Second direction is the protection from encroachment and the protection of traditions. Uh, conservative minds, which are in the overwhelming majority, are presented here, the development and transformation of the values uh, is done within the frameworks of interaction between people in different forms of activity. One of very important forms of activities, uh, joint activity, is communication. Galina Andreeva, the founder of the Chair of Social Psychology of Moscow University, identified three components here. Communication in uh, um, this communication, interaction and perception. When uh, uh, all the participants of this discourse are assessed and evaluated from the standpoint of the stages and levels of the development of social communication. It's necessary to identify the following stages. It's uh, speech and written language, which was predominant for many millenniums. Uh, then from the standpoint of uh, revolution and evolution, it's in invention by Van Gutenberg of the print machine in the 15th century appearance of newspapers and other mass media, the age uh, 19, age 20, new technologies, and then invention of electricity, enhanced el 
telegraph, telephone, radio, television. We referred to the first level of social mass communications. 20th century, the end of 20th century, the outset of 21st century brought us internet, social technologies. For us, it's the second level of mass social communications. Towards this end, sport becomes just a content. At uh, filling in the social information which is used in those means of social communication. We set forward the uh, tentative hypothesis that the uh, power of the influence of the nucleus and periphery upon the forms uh, of human activities are directed differently depending on the stages of development of mass social communications. And this slide. You can see the first tier or the first level of those mass com um, communication, geopolitical authorities uh, of power exercise, their power controlling mass media, they impact public institutions and form the nucleus of the values. But the direction of the force of influence of the nucleus of values are of centrifugal nature. As to the next tier or the second stage of development of social communications, mass media, mass communication means are characterized by the following parameters, and this is very important. Uh, uh, it's instantaneous. Uh, we push the button of our uh, telephone and transmit information. Huge cover and personified address, final address of the information. So 21st century, with its groundbreaking technologies in the sphere of social communications, enhance the nucleus of values so that all the forms of human uh, conscience and activities are giving up their autonomous uh, entity, uh, autonomous uh, uh, character, and are influenced by the nucleus of the values, just by one example. Economic policies uh, pursued in the sphere of new technologies to the detriment of economic gain, or some of the institutions of uh, church uh, accept uh, non-traditional, non-conventional uh, marriages, uh, violation of principles of tolerance, uh, international, um, international sports organizations, discard political neutrality, transformations of, politi of uh, uh, those values, according to Russian scientists. Uh, and it's very gratifying to see that we are like-minded people with Madame Robichevay here, we are soulmates. Uh, so Olympic sport has been losing its initial uh, uh, component, a social culture phenomenon, and is changed into the global business product. I quote your presentation. That way, ethical norms and principles are subsiding to the background, and uh, victory, uh, material gain are on the cutting edge. Nonetheless, social positions are there. There are very important processes on the way it's conformism or changes in behavior or opinion of people under the influence of uh, implicit or explicit, real or implied pressure exercised by other people or group of people. I would like to come up with another quotation uh, as uh, Rick from Neo Freudism scientist was saying that conformism is broadly developed amid contemporary society as a protective form of behavior. A conformist uh, stops being himself, but he absorbs another type of personality which is suggested to him uh, by models of culture, and he becomes another personality which others expect him to see. That way, a man does not experience apprehension, anxiety, anxiety and sol solitude, but the price he has to pay for that is the loss of his own inner uh, soul, of his own 
inner entity. Uh, there could be two alternatives for the would-be world. Sport world will end up with destructive conflict, uh, but conflicts have gotten uh, also uh, good function, uh, uh, creation function, or a sports movement will get onto no spiral of its development. Yes, we are confronted by a dilemma. What we are to expect from future? What's your take on it? Your personal take on it? Which uh, value transformation of Olympic sport will be enabling for it? Uh, will make it survive amid contemporary turmoils? Now, first of all, um, uh, serious changes await us, uh, changes in the Olympic movement, in the approach to the um, uh, value orientation. But nonetheless, the history of civilization uh, proves that each and every new step uh, uh, is painful. So most probably we will move towards the next uh, step and stage, which will satisfy most of the participants of the movement. Another question. Um, uh, tomorrow, I will make a presentation at the plenary session. Um, uh, and I will speak about the same uh, topic, about the same theme, and I will carry out the content analysis of the opinions in the press. And uh, one of the opinions um, um, indicates, uh, shows w how we uh, should act under these conditions uh, in the context of the Olympic sport. and. Our leaders suggest that we should have uh, traditional Olympic Games, which would um, uh, comply with the ideals of Pierre de Coubertin in Russia. And these games should be an alternative to the Olympic Games of the present. Do you think this idea is um, um, re realistic? Uh, or will it fail? Now, let's have these games. Uh, uh, following the ideology of antiquity. Is that possible? Well, uh, I think we're doing the right thing, uh, studying the uh, teachings of Coubertin, but the direct coming, going back to that period of time is impossible. No. So, so this paradigm, this model of the development of the international Olympic movement has been put forward uh, by our leaders. Uh, so. As for the now, we will probably discuss that tomorrow at the plenary session. So, thank you very much. I would like to invite all of you to the plenary session tomorrow, because we have the honor uh, to um, present this topic at the plenary session, and I will uh, speak um, about these challenges, these problems associated with the development of the Olympic movement and uh, the sanctions uh, um, uh, under the pressure on the uh, Russian uh, athletes. And uh, we'll, I will come up with some ideas which might help us overcome the conflicts of today. That is the announcement for tomorrow, for the early morning um, uh, presentations. And the next speaker, Ksenia Kuprina. Yes, so we'll work till 2 o'clock. We have a lot planned. So, Ksenia. Igor Viktorovich, then they have some Chinese speakers. Uh, Anna Nikolaevna, and then we will see what the, uh, let's follow the program strictly so that um, by lunchtime we understand what, 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 what we can afford, but we are far from doing that, being able to do that. So let's be strict about timing. Ksenia? I will speak about anti-doping um, situation uh, within the framework of international sport movement. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I represent uh, the Lesgoft National State University of 
sports physical health in St. Petersburg, master's degree, a young researcher. Good afternoon to experts and listeners. So, uh, the anti-doping um, work within the framework of the anti-doping uh, sport movement. The, there are lots and lots of uh, parts in the present day situation and the international um, sports movement is regarded at the national level. The rational approach uh, to uh, this issue depends on the physical training of the athletes, but also on the way the training process is organized. And there are all types of training considered. Theoretical training is an integral part when building the process. And um, anti-doping support in s sports is a very important issue in the present-day movement. In this context, for the development um, of the sports movement at the international level, and it's very important to think about the anti-doping um, uh, education of students. The anti-doping programs are being perfected all the time, but they do not all provide um, the complete information. The events should be carried out at sports schools are in the background nowadays. Athletes rely very much on their own search for information. Now, within um, a few years, we have been organizing um, uh, questioning and analysis of the literature on um, anti-doping in sports. On the basis of the analysis of the federal standard of the profession, where you find the employment functions um, and the responsibility for providing the anti-doping information in schools, so this is the responsibility of the uh, professionals with the proper qualifications, but in 80 percent, the responsibility responsible person is a medical doctor. The main function of the doctor is medical support. And then for more, in for, it's, um, as for the attitude to doping in this case, is an extra work for the medical doctors, and it's not always paid for. And the professionals in this field are available at the Lesgoft University. At the present, we uh, there are two groups that have graduated. Um, um, and the next stage of study was the comparison of the analysis of the acting uh, anti-doping program, and including the Russian anti-doping program of, of 2017. The analysis shows that the main problem of the program is the distance um, work. The information is obtained um, at distance. The, there are just tests being organized. The pedagogical observation shows that the athletes read the information, but the knowledge is very superficial. They go to testing and then they, they answer using additional sources without getting deeper into the issue. In order to make the analysis more topical, um, uh, then we um, uh, uh, send out questionnaires among high-class uh, athletes in order to organize what the problems are within that particular field. And the key aspects here were uh, as follows. 76% of the uh, respondents get the information on their own from an, about anti-doping. The seminars on anti-doping anti support um, um, online and uh, are carried out just a few times a year. 80% of respondents would like to get the practical classes with the modeling of the doping control and interaction with the doping officers. And over half of the respondents are not familiar of the specialist who is responsible for anti-doping support. So the athletes. Um, when they come across difficult situations, do not know uh, whom they need to address at the regional level. Theoretical support uh, that is prescribed by the federal standard is organized as uh, self-preparation, uh, self-learning classes. Uh, the question is, allowed us to come up with certain appendixes, uh, and uh, the anti-doping program, as a result, was supplemented with those. When developing these programs, we considered those difficult um, aspects of the consumption of information by the athletes. We also considered how much time it takes uh, for them to uh, get acquainted with that, how much time can be spent on the theoretical um, uh, training. And we added a um, whole block um, uh, of uh, six practical classes, uh, uh, two hours each. 
And um, uh, we uh, used interactive approach um, um, for the uh, uh, information delivery. And here are the specifics of the program. The new block um, with several elements of the program incorporates the duties and the responsibilities of the athlete, what is allowed and what is not, lectures, provocations, modeling of the situation um, in the field of anti-doping support, anti-doping control, the behavior conducts, uh, behavior rules, and the doping control in the format of the uh, game, imitation game. This block is aimed at the providing information for the athletes um, and the doping uh, support. These are uh, offline classes with different methods of information delivery. Um, business game, imitation game, round table, uh, lectures, provocations, modeling of the doping control procedures and uh, questionnaires and uh, quests. We think that these programs will increase the level of knowledge and will um, um, lower down the number of uh, athletes disqualified. The doping problem is a serious problem, and the level of uh, sportsmanship increases step by step, and uh, that means that each and every athlete will come across the problems of anti-doping control, and they should know their rights, their responsibilities when they use different drugs. All this is very much important to be considered during the training process. And um, according to our opinion, the modeling and imitation forms of information delivery will be of great use. Thank you very much, because these were very interesting sociological studies and recommendations. Are there any questions uh, to our speaker? Allow me to add a few words. Uh, starting with 2019 at the Lesgoft University, we are teaching anti-doping law. And uh, you know, all the issues uh, associated with the anti-doping support are being studied. Uh, the, these are the types of legal responsibility and liability of the athletes for uh, the uh, doping use. Uh, criminal liability um, uh, in relation to the coaches, uh, dis disciplinary uh, responsibility. We have lectures and seminars dedicated to that. So uh, uh, everything that is being suggested is already with us. and. Uh, in February this year, we opened a national anti-doping laboratory for um, uh, law research at the uh, Institute of Management and Social Technologies. And so we have a whole concept uh, for the development of the laboratory. Uh, we examine you know, foreign legislation, of course, and as I said, we work on the draft um, anti-doping law of the Russian Federation. And quite soon, we will be able to present this draft document at the conferences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're getting closer and closer to lunch, so time is limited. So let's listen to one other presentation, and then we'll have lunch. We'll continue our work after lunch at 3, at 3. At three. At three. There will be mostly Chinese presentations, online presentations. Do come and listen to them. We might have some interesting presentations. And the final presentation uh, before lunch, Dr. Karchagin, our next speaker, the Military Institute of Physical Culture, Igor Karchagin. And Petersburg candidate of pedagogics will speak about the global sports space in the world using the example of international military and sports cooperation. Ten minutes. So, so we'll speak about the global sports space in the contemporary world using the example of international military sports cooperation. 
There, uh, there is a lot of different sports organizations in the world today. The uh, larger one uh, is the International Olympic Committee. But because of the difficult international situation um, associated with the ban for the Russian um, athletes to take part um, under the auspices of the International um, um, uh, Committee, we decided to look at the possibilities of the military sports cooperation formed um, uh, in the process of the development of sports in many countries of the world, brings together um, uh, athletes and uh, coaches and uh, many other professionals in the field. And it became particularly significant when the International Council of uh, Military Sports appeared, um, which was formed in 1948. And, uh, um, the Sports Committee of Friendly Armies uh, appeared in 1958. That was the Warsaw Bloc countries united into that. The uh, former Soviet republics um, uh, entered uh, this organization, and this is a new step in its development. It is being turned into a universal system of military and sports cooperation. Entering um, uh, this organization, Russia made uh, this organization larger, turned it into a truly global organization, enriched it with its own traditions and experience accumulated over decades. And the examination of the experience of the training of the um, military officers makes it possible to look for the new ways of the improvement of physical training of the officers in the um, uh, armed forces of Russia. We can divide um, uh, the training process into several stages. The first uh, stage, uh, um, historically, uh, it's up to uh, 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 2018. Uh, participation in different clubs and different federations, army athletes as well trained and well prepared and well organized took part in different, uh, um, uh, uh, on behalf of different teams of the countries in Russia. Uh, the fencing school created in Petrograd was very important. One of the leading specialists uh, um, in establishing military sports conflicts was Colonel Mardovin, um, who later um, uh, was the head of our school. Next period of time, that's. Uh, 1918, 1941, after the First World War, a lot of attention was being paid to sports between the athletes of Belgium, France, England, uh, Italy. Competitions were organized, and uh, they, they were uh, joined by the uh, military officers from America. That was uh, the period of time when cooperation in this field was born. Um, sports, uh, sp sportsmen, uh, athletes, uh, took part in different championships in the Olympic Games, mostly in fencing, uh, mostly in um, uh, shooting, in archery, and, um, and then uh, 1945, 1985, immediately after the Second World War, the, the, a lot of attention was being paid uh, for physical training of the officers in the army in order to use the potential abilities of the uh, athletes. And it was necessary to be able to test them properly and to overcome the problems in this field. In 1948 in France, uh, the International Council of Military Sports was founded with just 500 to begin with. Uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Benelux in France, and um, there was um, the um, uh, pentathlon orientation, and the quiz, the parachuting, and uh, uh, different types of wrestling. Well, then, uh, since there appeared many more women in the army, uh, these competitions were uh, arranged for women as well. That the period of time, the the the, uh, the committee for friendly armies uh, uh, disintegrated, and many of the members of that group um, entered the international group. The next uh, period of time is up to the year 2007. SISM acquired um, international um, um, standard, international. Um, um, became internationally renowned. So the number of countries, uh, members of that increased. About 130 countries from all over the world began to take part in the um, uh, work organized by it. This international committee uh, introduced new competitions, uh, the day of uh, jogging, the day of running, really. Uh, they, they, they were the, for the first time, the Winter Games were organized and the Cadet Games. 
Now, the present day stage uh, uh, witnesses um, uh, different types of uh, championships. Once in four years, uh, the military, uh, the global military games uh, are organized with about 10,000 participants annually in the countries that is of running are organized. The, this, uh, this international organization provides different types of assistance uh, to the parties involved. In the military sports cooperation, we can find positive and negative experience as well. Present, we can find new ways to, uh, um, to further development, rethinking of the accumulated material with the help of different methodologies and uh, research means and new approaches uh, to the uh, summation and generalization in order to understand and to forecast many of the processes that occur in the international military sports movement. Thank you very much. Just one question. Uh, no. Today, with the sanctions on uh, different uh, sports in Russia, uh, um, the military sports competitions, how are they arranged? The Russian team is still being invited in August last year, in August. Uh, there were um, uh, global cadet uh, games uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, initially, about 65 countries wanted to take part, but uh, because of the difficulties, because of the events of February last year, many of the countries um, uh, decided not to, but 30 countries uh, arrived, uh, the, the countries who are pro-Russian. And um, you know, there was quite a significant championship, and the Russian team uh, won the largest number of medals. So as for the military sports cooperation, quite a lot of work is being done, and it's a step-by-step um, -step movement for the better. This is Congress in Moscow, um, uh, is being held in Moscow, our head is uh, uh, appointed and uh, the 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 composition of the teams. Uh, are there European countries present? Uh, no, at the games in Saint Petersburg, the European countries were not present. No, Armenia, Azerbaijan, African countries, and the quality of the competition has it gone down? The competition was it as significant as strong? No, no. Well, obvious. Well, of course. It leads to lower level, because our team really did not have strong opponents. Uh, well, the the armies of the um, uh, United Arab Emirates. So, uh, as there are leaders, but if we uh, take the overall situation, the what is what is the general attitude to that. No, uh, the, uh, the main uh, uh, the moves to friendship through sports, so we would like to be able to communicate. Uh, these sanctions, um, they, uh, they do not help development at all. No, that's true. Yeah, that's true. The answer is clear. Yes, I'd like to add a few words. Is that the topic of your research work, or is that your professional work? No, it's not a, a, a result of a research. No, not really. When uh, our uh, leader decided to work on international cooperation, then uh, he um, granted us with certain responsibilities. I am representing the scientific center of the um, uh, sports uh, training within the army. So are you uh, familiar with the uh, Pom room in our university? Because we, uh, we were, well, we housed the cadet corps in the days of Catherine II. You should read the book of ours. Yeah, you can, yes, I'm familiar with that. Jean de Pom is with us. Uh, but Jean de Pom 
uh, say in the Soviet days, many tried to get in there into this hall for Jean de Pomme, and there were articles about the um, uh, that particular hall. Uh, but for different conditions, for different reasons, it still exists. And since this was part of the uh, cadet corps, it's quite interesting. And there is an article about it in the book. Yes, all right, we'll consider that. Let's thank our speaker. Um, the final session, the final speaker of the session. We wish you uh, to add uh, some results of research work to that because the topic is quite interesting. And indeed, we are at a um, difficult period of time. It's interesting to compare what we had, what we have, uh, in order to understand uh, what might happen, including the field of military sports events. And one announcement. Here is a questionnaire for participants. If you have filled it in, bring it here to this desk. So lunch, 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 lunch. And we would like to see you here at the second part of the session.
Иван, а может быть мы сейчас онлайн доклад сделаем? Colleagues, uh, we carry on with our session. Next presentation will be uh, by Professor Yu Song, China, Values and Perspectives of Joint Bidding of Major International Events from the Perspective of uh, Cooperation and Competition. Ten minutes, please. <laughs> I'm Yue Yusong from Tianjin University of Sport. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to attend the conference. The topic I am asked to speak on is the value and the prospect of the joint bidding for major international sports events from the perspective of cooperation and competition. My presentation will include these four parts. First, the background of our research. Second, the research methods. Third, research results. And the last, the, some conclusions we have got. The first part of the research, which is the relevant background of the research. Joint bids for large-scale sports events have gradually become a new trend. The joint bid for large-scale international sports events can not only improve the level of organization and the management of sports events, but also enhance the teamwork ability among countries and promote cultural, sports, economic, and other exchanges between countries. The purpose of this article is to theoretically analyze the joint bidding of multiple cities or countries across countries and regions to host international large-scale sports events from the perspective of cooperative competition theory. The second part of the report is the research method. This article aims to explore the value and the prospect of joint bids for large-scale international sports events from the perspective of competition and cooperation. Examples of joint bids for sports events in order to better understand the value and the prospects of future joint events. The third part is the research results. Theoretical basis is co-competition theory. Co-competition theory is usually used to explain the complicated competition and cooperation behaviors among enterprise or organizations. Brandenburg and Neil Buff established this theory in 1996. They established a game mode and analyzed the formation factors of competition and cooperation. The theory of cooperation and competition defines three target structures individual structure, competitive structure, and the collaborative structure. The core logic of the theory is win-win, a strategy partnership that is cooperative and uh, seek greater benefits. The follows are the results of the study. 
first contribute to the maximization of the interests of the host. Joint bids for large-scale international sports events can increase the economic development of the host country and enhance the social influence of sports. From the perspective of income, the sponsors undoubtedly have great motivation. However, since each by the country is an independent economic, each bidder everyone will try their best to increase their profits and reduce costs in order to maximize their benefits. Second, contribute to the allocation of event resources and the improvement of influence. From the perspective of competition, there are two main factors to be considered among the partnership and the joint competition. One is government support. The other is the effective allocation of resources. First of all, government support is an important prerequisite for joint bids to host major international sports events. Different host countries have different government support, police and funds, which will eventually lead to differences in the influence of the event among the host countries. Government competition can effectively promote the influence of events. Secondly, the effective allocation of resources is an important support for the joint bid to host the major international sports events. Different hosts have different resource allocations, so there is bound to be a competitive relationship. Resource competition can make full use of and uh, integrate the existing resources of the hosts, learn from each other, and make the event run better. Finally, contribute to mutual trust and uh, exchange between countries. First of all, when two or more countries jointly bid to host a large-scale sport event, it will help promote friendly relationship between the two countries, ease tensions between the two countries, and enhance mutual trust between the two countries. Secondly, joint bids for sports events can also promote economic development between the two countries. So, through joint bids for sports events, the two countries can share the economic burden of the competition, thereby saving money and uh, obtaining more economic benefits. In addition, joint bidding can promote the development of international sports events, improve the quality of events, and enhance the influence of international sports events. Finally, the joint bid can also promote cultural and technical exchange between countries, and the hosts can share their own experience in hosting the competition to improve the level of the competition. The last part is the research conclusion. The joint bid for large-scale international sports events is a bid method with dual natures of cooperation and competition, and its value and the prospect are very considerable. First of all, joint bids can promote cooperation. Through cooperation, countries and regions can make full use of each other's resources so that both parties can benefit from it. Secondly, the joint bid can promote competition. During the joint bid, the two parties can exchange technology and management experience with each other, and each use their own advantages, which can bring a good competitive environment for both parties so that 
both parties can improve their own capabilities, thereby promoting large-scale international sports events. Finally, the joint bid provides an opportunity for the two countries to showcase their own cultures. It can show the cultural history and the innovative spirit of the two countries to the world, so that the two countries can show their own characteristics to the world and let more countries understand the two countries expand international influence of both countries. So that's all for my presentation. If you have any question, please feel free to contact me. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Dear attendees, are there any questions from the floor? Use the microphone, please. Okay, no questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your participation, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. See you soon. We hope that next year we're going to see each other. Do come over, visit us in St. Petersburg and continue your wonderful studies and research. And we'll be very glad to hear you and to participate in those studies whenever it's possible. If you are interested in some studies or joint studies or the studies on your topic, which could be done in our country, we'll be only glad to join up with that. Next, uh, Anna Nalogina, a doctor of biology, associate professor, inclusive uh, sport as the step forward to formation of inclusive society. Anna is from Moscow State uh, Pedagogical University from Moscow. Floor is yours, Anna. Good afternoon. Distinguished Madam Chair, good afternoon, dear attendees. I appreciate this opportunity to share with you the outcomes of my studies, and I will speak about inclusive sport as the step forward towards formation of inclusive society. Before I get down to the subject matter of my presentation, I would like to address all the attendees of our convention just to close your eyes and conjure a situation. Which associations evolve in your mind when you hear this word inclusion? You might conjure a special pandases or hoisting up devices for wheelchair people or special schools for school children with uh, limited capability or cafeterias for children with Down syndrome or uh, autistic uh, range impairment or whatever. But uh, there is a lot more to it than that, to this definition or connotation, inclusion. It encompasses different strata of our society. In September 2015, UN uh, adopted the program for the sustainable development of society until 2030. In this program, they have articulated 22 goals uh, to be attained for sustainable development of society. These are 
SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, all of them are inclusive because all of them in their own way uh, provide for access to different resources. Out of those 22 uh, goals, six goals are related to people with limited capabilities with health problems. You can see them here in this slide. In its development, society has been reconsidering its attitude towards people with uh, health problems and disabilities. The society went through long and winding road from exclusion. One weaker, physically underdeveloped children or children with problems of health were thrown off the cliff. Uh, that's the way the society got rid of them. Next, it was segregation. One disabled people were allowed uh, to live among uh, healthy people, but neither efforts were put together to help those people. And in most ways, those people were strongly dependent upon the uh, members of the family who were supporting the king who had problems with health. Next stage was integration. And uh, nowadays, we have been gearing towards the next stage, its inclusion. Of course, we can continue along those lines. The society has been changing, uh, redefining it itself. We can uh, seek advice of future religious specialists, but we can conjure different situations and trends uh, uh, which will come along in our society and change of attitude towards disabled people. We are now at the crossroads between integration and inclusion. So I would like to show you one case study about inclusion. Check it out. Are there physical disorders in those uh, males? They have got the pathology of locomotor system, and they have got problems with moving around. But if you check out this slide by the same token, we're going to see that those males have got um, uh, skeletal muscle system disorders, but no one of us sitting in this hall would be able to outstrip them in the pace they are moving with. You can see that those people have got special uh, devices helping them to move around much faster than uh, for people without any special needs. Let's look at what you, are there any problems with uh, motion for this girl? We can see that she has a locomotive problem and that she has a special device that helps her move about. But nonetheless, this girl cannot move without an assistance, without the uh, architectural barriers. If you look at the lower picture, we will see here that here at this crossroads, this girl would have been able to move without any um, specific problems. That means that with our uh, activity, we are creating the social barriers. And let's look into the future, into the inclusive society that we are all aiming at. Let's think of that. Uh, is it a problem just for the girl in a um, wheel? In in a uh, wheelchair. This particular crossroads is inconvenient for many others. If you take a bicycle, for example, or a scooter, uh, it's much easier to move if there are no barriers on, on the road. You might remember when you were away um, uh, um, and uh, you had to have a suitcase on the wheels, and of course it was a problem to move around if there are um, barriers like that. So for uh, mothers with prams, it's also a problem. So creating a without uh, uh, the, the architecture, urban architecture without barriers, we create comfortable conditions for everyone and not just for the people with special needs. Let's move 
to uh, physical culture and sports and look at the legal norms that exist in this field, we can see that there are all the necessary legal acts in place that make it possible to go in for uh, physical training and physical exercises for everyone, not only for healthy people and athletes, but also people with special needs. In the law on physical culture and sport, uh, there is a chapter three that is dedicated to adaptive um, approaches and to the uh, uh, sport um, for the disabled. And um, uh, you can also find the, the purposes of going into sports for these people. And the main purpose is uh, to achieve uh, integration into the society and social adaptation for these people. In the program uh, for physical culture and sports in the Russian Federation, uh, we can find some targets. And um, uh, by 2030, uh, thus, according to this program, 30% of people with uh, uh, different health problems and uh, different forms of invalidity must be involved into regular um, um, uh, uh, training. Uh, uh, well, uh, I do doubt that all these targets are achieved, but let's look at the resources. Uh, what can provide uh, this large number of disabled people in the sphere of physical culture and sport? Now, at present, we um, uh, have analyzed uh, all the forms and all the formats of uh, um, going into physical uh, training for uh, the disabled people, and we were able to set out three models, uh, which are schematically presented here. The first of them is special. The second one is integrated, um, uh, spontaneous, uh, based on the practical experience. He can interpret it in different ways. Uh, but it seems to me that this is a transition uh, uh, model on the way to the inclusive model, which at present is not that well spread in the Russian Federation. And uh, then allow me to comment uh, on um the first and the third models. The first model it's quite special. It appeared historically earlier than others, and today this model is quite well tested, and uh, uh, there is quite um, a large number of different documents uh, associated with it. There are also different methodologies related to it. So what is the uh, uh, this, uh, this special model is built on the differentiation of disabled um, uh, athletes uh, by the type of their um, deficiency, by the nosological group. And so there's a federal standard um, uh, sports training following these um, uh, sports, and you can see that in the basis of the standards, there are the deficiencies that they suffer from. So there is a federal standard for the uh, uh, um, uh, people with um, hearing problems, for uh, uh, a locomotive, for people with locomotive problems, and for the blind people, and so on. So it's nosology that is in the basis of that. If we take the inclusive model of the sports training of the uh, people with special needs, we will see that this model is uh, um, present only in the um, uh, um, uh, author's programs, because uh, the inclusive programs um, in the resources I'm familiar with, you won't find um, it. Uh, so inclusive model uh, means that we step away from the nosology towards uh, uh, the sports, as it happens with the healthy. Uh, athletes, and of course, this model emerges um, or uh, um, brings up certain problems uh, with implementation because a coach has a serious problem, and the problem is uh, as follows: um, uh, the coach needs to be able to organize the inclusive process, and I would like to share some experience of the um, model implementation, and uh, we carried out this work together with with our um, uh, colleagues from Kazakhstan within the framework of the program, the sports for all and uh, sport without uh, boundaries. So inclusive um, uh, approach was employed for the organization of uh, uh, training for children. The source uh, here 
uh, was s rather sad statistics. At the time of the implementation in 2016 in Kazakhstan, there were just 0.2 percent with different disabilities were involved in this um, additional uh, training in sports. And um, uh, this fact le led to the opening of uh, a whole uh, group of uh, sport clubs for children with different forms of disabilities. And uh, here in this slide you can see the intermediary results. Here is the distribution of the children by the sports. And you can see that in Kazakhstan, um, the uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, we're talking about Kazakhstan. Uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, um, uh, 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 adaptive swimming, adaptive uh, taekwondo and karate are most popular. Oh, well, considering the um, ethnic specifics, it's um, an expected result. But of interest is uh, the fact that swimming and other sports uh, um, were very popular among um, teenagers with different uh, um, uh, problems. Uh, so if you take swimming, you will find different nosologies present here, um, uh, different combinations of those mental problems and locomotive problems and um, um, problems of the with the sensor systems. This inclusive uh, um, uh, pr approach was um, used um, in different parts of the Republic and at the time of the project implementation. So by the end of 2022, the number of uh, um, these children went up uh, from 10 to 700 plus. So the project is still uh, working. Uh, and we do hope that the number of children in Kazakhstan involved um, um, uh, uh, increases. And of course, I mean that these are children with different uh, special health needs. So finally, we can say that uh, in our society, time has come for changes, changes that would make it possible to move from a special model of sports uh, and sports training focused on nosology to the inclusive model which is orientated at the sports and makes it possible uh, to uh, get um, uh, engaged for different athletes with different health problems. Thank you for your attention, and I w would very much like to work together with you. Are there any questions uh, to the speaker? It's a very important topic socially and as a research work. A question. No. Um, uh, so what about funding in this field, in your region? I am from Moscow. And this model in our region is uh, being um, implemented just through private resources. But in Kazakhstan, the situation is different. Uh, they follow the inclusive approach, and uh, 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 my co-author would have been able to describe the funding system there. But since I am involved, I do know that uh, funding is provided uh, through private-public partnership. There are funds, foundations, uh, public organizations, and donors, and they're all involved in that project. No, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very uh, interesting and very important socially. Allow me to invite another speaker. Let me remind you uh, that we should always remember timing. Our next speaker is Alicia uh, Lin. Yes, with us. Ideals and conflicts. 
sustainable uh, development in a contemporary Olympic movement. movement. The topic of my report is ideas and conflicts, a study of sustainable development in the modern Olympic movement. I will report from the following four parts. Part one, introduction. The Olympic movement is the world's largest sports event, and for a long time, Every move of the Olympic movement has attracted widespread attention around the world. Whether in terms of competitive level, economic effects, social value and education. In recent years, due to various influencing factors such as the spread of the global epidemic, the willingness of countries to publicize the outside world through the Olympic Games and other means has also decreased. Therefore, the study starts from the lofty ideals of the modern Olympic movement, grasp the difficulties and conflicts encountered, and put forward corresponding strategy based on the problem. This research was carried out by most of literature reviews and logical analysis. Through CNKI, one found database, web of science, and other database and related books. Consult the documents related to the Olympic Games for study and then organize and summarize the relevant technology. Lying Assault, Therapy Co. Foundation for this research. Part three, primary coverage. This, the third part consists of the three small points. One is the noble ideals of the modern Olympic movement. Two is the conflicts between the ideal and the reality of the development of the modern Olympic movement. Three is the conflict between scientific and technology and development humanism. Part four is the conclusion. The revival of the modern Olympic movement based on lofty ideals also need to return to Olympic values to spread and popularize spreading the seeds of Olympic culture, bringing people closer, in, inspiring and educating the younger generation is the true meaning. The IOC should cooperate with different organizations share benefits, and enhance its influence in cooperation. Of course, the cooperative organizations here are not limited to organizations in the field of the sport, but also organizations in the field of finance and education must open their doors to respond to crises and challenges in different types. That's all my report. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was um, quite interesting and topical for the present day. Now, we would also like to invite uh, uh, um, 
uh, our uh, colleague to continue these studies uh, together with our researchers. Even today, during the session, we um, paid quite a lot of attention uh, to the following fact. The modern Olympic uh, movement requires new studies, requires modernization, requires new uh, um, promotion forms. So thank you very much for your contribution. And once again, we would like to invite you to examine these social problems together with us. Thank you. Now, the next uh, speaker, Natalia Karmaeva, are you with us? No, she is not here. All right, then our next speaker is from China again. Li Suilin. With us? Oh, we we have already listened to Li Suilin Li Suilin's presentation. No, Chi Guapen. Sorry. No, no. Okay. Then you, Yang. You, you, Yang. Yes. All right. So, uh, our speaker from China, uh, the um, well. Uh, sportsmanship, the importance of sportsmanship, using the experience of China and the Olympic sports. You're welcome. This is Yang Yue from Tianjin University of Sport, China. Today, the topic I'm going to share is the significance of sportsmanship construction, taking China and Olympic sports as an example. The report consists of four parts. The first one is sports and sportsmanship, and the second one, sportsmanship and its value. The third one, the significance of sportsmanship construction. The fourth one, the conclusion. At the very beginning, it is the sports and sportsmanship. Being as a kind of human social activities, Sports have emerged and evolved in people's social production and life, which are closely related to social politics, economy, science, culture, education, military, and etc. Sports taking the comprehensive development of human beings as the object, strengthens people physic through exercise and promotes social development and civilization progress. This sportsmanship, which is constantly produced and accumulated in sports, is the guiding ideology and soul of sports work, as well as an important part of social spiritual civilization construction. It plays quite an important role in improving people's moral quality and improving social civilization. Though the concept of Chinese sportsmanship was put forward in modern times, the orientation of Chinese sports can be dated back in long before. The fact that sports have entered the lives of Chinese people has deeply rooted in Irish Chinese. And Chinese sportsmanship is the creativization of the joint action of Chinese national spirit and sports spirit. It is an innovative and outstanding culture after the introduction and assimilation of Western civilization. And for the Olympic sports and sportsmanship, the emergence of Olympic Games is the combination 
a combination of ancient Greek mythology and competitive sports, the main core of which is still dominated by competitive sports. With the vigorous development of Olympic sports, the spirit brought by sports have attracted people's attention. Today, many people's insight that they think the faster, higher, stronger, and together is the sportsmanship of Olympic Games and the purpose of the Olympic spirit is to promote the development of human spirit so as to bring up our round development of people. And for the second part is the sportsmanship and its value. Sportsmanship is a special spiritual will whose origin comes from the development of Western ancient Greek mythology and ancient Olympic Games. The development of the games makes people realize the importance of sports spirit and expands the value of sportsmanship more specifically on the basis of development of modern sports. The first one is to foster people's good qualities. Sports is the most popular group event in the world. The sportsmanship produced in sports activities also meets the needs of the mass spiritual culture, which makes the sportsmanship as the core spirit of sports culture. And the second one is to improve people's all-round development. In sports, the athlete is the protagonist. People's virus body functions have been exercised and improved during the sports activities, such as the speed, endurance in physical body, and the emotion, will, moral character, and spiritual power, and the fairness, competition, intelligence in terms of social nature of human. And third one is to promote human socialization. In modern society, man is no longer an individual, but a social person living in society. Only by living and communicating in group activities can he or she become a real man. And the last one is to build up the proper concept of values. Physical exercise and spiritual pleasure brought by sports can be if an effective way to remove people's bad habits so as to achieve the sublimation of spiritual needs and to form a proper outlook on life and values. This is the survey we have done about whether sports you have participated or you are familiar with can reflect the enterprising view and whether the spectacular match can make you excited and full of positive energy. For third part, it is the significance of sportsmanship construction. I will illustrate this part from three perspectives. They are social, national, and civic level. The first part is for the social level. It will help with the blueprint for a free society and the fulfillment of eco-social concepts and the observance of enduring and just social order. And the last one, the improvement of people's awareness of the rule of law. And the second part is from the national level. It is the embodiment of harmony between the nations, the inheritance Reglame, of Reglame. democratic belief and the symbol of national civilization as well as the national prosperity and strength. For the civic level, it is the cohesion of patriotic sentiments and it is the improvement of citizens' virtue. And it is the improvement of citizens' integrity character. And for the fourth one, it is a profound impact on friendship. And the last one, it is a spiritual development of citizen. Now, 
here it comes for the conclusion part. Sportsmanship itself belongs to culture, ideological perspective. On the one hand, any kind of important spiritual guidance or spiritual forms in some way contains the value and nature of human beings, which is universal. But on the other hand, the value of any kind of spiritual guidance or spiritual forms is historic. Only when it constitutes the spirit of the time can it be combined with the process of society. Therefore, no matter for the Oriental sportsmanship as China or the Western sportsmanship as Olympic, both of them share their similarities, which are the essence of basic sports spirit, yeah, such as friendship, solidarity, and fire play, etc. Meanwhile, each of these sportsmanship enjoys its own characteristics due to the regional, historical, culture, and political factors. When introducing and participating in Western sports, Chinese sports accepted it from the form and the aspect of objects and embodied Chinese thinking features and patterns in the aspect of thoughts, in which the unity of human and nature are reconstructed on the basis of these two highly differentiated signs. It should be noted that the sports as a cultural activity of human beings has a different cultural environment and humanistic scale, and none of this social group or individual can reluctantly and artificially provide a humanistic value for a society. From this double scale mentioned above, one should neither establish the organism of one single sportsmanship nor cling to the other. Only from the current situation of country or region can we reflect its own characteristics and the characteristics of the times. For China, we should keep the main body of Chinese sports spirit and absorb the essence of Western part. It should be a kind of self-conscious and active culture and spiritual innovation and... Uh, sorry, uh, you should wrap up your presentation. Uh, you should... ...background factor of external introduction. Okay, this is so much about the report I'm going to share with you today. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating in our scientific congress. And uh, uh, you uh, have uh, expanded upon the uh, declarations and very important conclusion, but we don't see the results of your studies. Maybe next time you'll provide us with some sociological studies or attitude of citizens of China towards Chinese projects and the attitude of young people towards the Olympic sports and so sports and sportsmanship is very important, of course. The Olympic project is very important, but everyone should participate and speak for 10 minutes only. Thank you very much for participating once again. Natalia Karmaeva. The floor goes to Natalia Karmaeva, PhD in sociology, associate professor, National Research Institute of High School for Economics, Moscow. He'll speak about principles of physical education of Petro Leskov against the backdrop of contemporary discourse about the independence of the personality, human personality. Ten minutes, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you see my presentation? I guess you do. 
you can see it. I'll dwell on the studies done at the Institute for Education and also I'll refer to my previous joint work with Nikolai Karmaev. Now we have got another project about uh, independent personalities and uh, personalities in contemporary world. We have got basic and applied research done on this topic. And today I would like to dwell upon the theoretical analysis of the concept of independent personality related to the ideas of Potter Leskoft and to display the fact that Lesgaf's ideas are yet very relevant. So what is the independence all about? Here you can see several components of that. It's conscious uh, uh, choice, self-control, and a definition of the goal. Independence is perceived as one of the prerequisites for the education and learning, which has been gearing towards enhancing well-being of a personality, implicit and explicit. As to implicit, one is uh, satisfaction. Well-being is satisfaction with your life, uh, being sure of yourself, and so on. Uh, Explicit characteristics uh, of well-being are wage, uh, salary, health, and so on. A strengthening of individual well-being may be done via the concept of uh, lifelong learning and formation of responsibility for your own actions. From the perspective of the theory, these concepts are centered around the concept of lifelong learning. This is the fusion of formal and informal education, the engagement of an individual in both formats, and how it's related to the development of a personality. Uh, striving uh, to pass through the preset situation in order to achieve the desired status. The desired state and condition is related to well-being in its different aspects and about transcending the boundaries of preset uh, uh, things uh, to get more latitude for actions uh, and to uh, push the horizons of what you can achieve. That is about capacity building, an extension of capacity of an individual. To those who are not familiar with this study, Potter of Lesgaard worked on the bridge between 19th and 20th century. In the end of the 19th century, he uh, set up uh, the training courses uh, for uh, pedagogues, uh, for teacher trainers, uh, specialists uh, in the sphere of physical exercise, physical education. And he was a model for his times. He represented a humanistic school of thought. Uh, the psychology uh, in education, which was most important from his perspective for the personality of a learner, of a trainee, a disciple or a learner is perceived as conscious and proactive participant of educational process. And the process of education is uh, fostering versatile comprehensive personality. According to Petr Lekskov, it was about uh, fostering people with strong will and strong spirit, humanistic direction uh, is uh, yet very topical nowadays because those studies in the sphere of uh, the independence of personality and its autonomy and so from this humanistic school of thought 
which we can trace in the works of the researchers, outstanding researchers of the Renaissance times. And Peter Leskoft's uh, ideas are embedded into a system of action which is directed at uh, gaining results related to enhancing level of well-being, implicit and explicit, so that the personality could reconsider what uh, he or she do, does, uh, manage your body and your mind uh, to display the principle uh, of freedom of or freedom from, and the freedom for doing something, mastering all your functions in the context of life per se, or freedom from different constraints, physical constraints, or contextual constraints. Mindful of that, we perceive the actions of a subject via the prism of connotations and definitions of exercise. According to Leskov, everything which is exercised and perfected is uh, developed and improved. Everything which is not exercised uh, falls apart and deteriorates. Uh, so he was focusing upon enhancing the skills of resilience uh, to all the environments. Exercise impacts positively the development of the human organism. It's the basis for development. It's a certain set of skills which enables an individual to regulate his or her activity. That way, exercise is related to self-regulation self and the ability to exercise uh, self-regulated uh, learning. As to my conclusions, I'm here to see that conscience, uh, conscious activities and gradual movement from uh, simple to complex, uh, uh, from uh, easy to more difficult to do, develops uh, independence and conscience. Uh, so it's part of the lifelong learning concept. It could be interpreted broadly. Exercise is not just about physical exercise, but also learning, learning in different forms, uh, learning some new skills. The principle of exercise can be embedded into any processes whatsoever related to self-regulated education and formation of a subject with a high degree of autonomy. That's it. Thank you very much. No. With limited time, we do not uh, give time for questions. Uh, no. Well, okay, we can do it, uh, but uh, if, if he listens to us. Chiguapen, is he with us? Then, Nikolai Stepanovich. That's right. Nikolai Zagurski, candidate of pedagogics, professor, will speak about the uh, global and uh, Russian biathlon. After the Winter Olympic Games, uh, modern trends and prospects for development. Extensive topic. Keep within the time limit. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to thank for the chance to take part in the International Congress. Now, uh, the first championship in Bertlon um, uh, was held in 1968 in Austria. And, uh, uh, skiing and shooting, that, that's combined. And uh, so there was uh, 
20 kilometers for men. And the first championship among women was held in 1984. Slow down a bit. Mm, yeah. uh, the uh, Olympic Games in Beijing included six uh, types of biathlon sprint, individual um, uh, competition, um, it's in the uh, respective with a mixed um, uh, mixed race, with were two uh, laps by men and two laps by women. Seven disciplines uh, since uh, 2019, also the laps. And so the uh, duration from 20 minutes, uh, sprinters up to um, uh, 50 minutes for individual uh, competition. And of, uh, the massive, the mass start is um, uh, the typical of all the uh, types. Lately, uh, there is a clear cut structure of the championships of Europe and the World and the World Cups uh, among the adults and uh, um, the championship among the uh, junior group girls and boys, and uh, the Union of Berlinists uh, in Russia uh, actually included 19 steps and stages of the World Cup and plus the championship seven starts in the season 2022-23, uh, 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 eight stages and the championship of the world that included uh, five laps five uh, runs. As a rule, all the competitions are carried out in Europe, with, what, with the exception of those competitions which were held within the framework of the pre-Olympic week in Japan in 1997 in the United States in the year 2001, Canada, um, uh, uh, um, uh, and in Korea. In Beijing, the pre-Olympic week did not take place because of the pandemic. Now, we should also mention that the, politic, the politics of Alberns uh, envisages uh, the uh, competition in the United States and in Canada once in two years. So uh, it means the, the, the time um, at one firing range uh, has uh, gone down by the respective number of percentages uh, over 20 years. The precision of shooting um, has increased and actually reached the level of 90%. Now, we can see a sustainable trend of the um, increase of the speed of moving along the distance, so men, um, uh, 86 meters per second, uh, and uh, as, uh, less faster than women. And uh, um, uh, the, the decrease of the speed um, in certain ranges uh, is explained by the fact that the uh, lubricants of certain type have been Band. And when organizing these major events, uh, we um, should remember that um, uh, the focus and attention is popularization of Beatlon. And uh, um, there is an intrigue in online effect. These are the uh, must starts, and uh, they're quite interesting. The races are with different laps are quite interesting. This all indicates that the Beatlon is growing more popular and that uh, the audience watching Beatlon is increasing. Increasing, and the slides demonstrate that. As a result of sanctions, the Russian Berlon um, has been banned from uh, the international competitions. We were unable to take part in the competition starting with March last year. What is the outcome here? Joint competitions uh, together with the Belarus uh, team. Uh, altogether, five uh, competitions were organized um, um, for the Commonwealth, um, uh, and uh, this made it possible to compensate for the absence of the international starts and uh, uh, not to lose the um, uh, competition conditions and status. And as for the plans, um, um, we, we had to, uh, we planned winter uh, <coughs> competitions for different age categories for men and women. We had championship of Russia. 
uh, six uh, stages and 18 starts within the framework of the Russian Championship, 10 uh, sets of medals, um, um, six um, Olympic, and altogether 40 starts, 42 starts, which complies with the World Cup um, requirements and the practice of the strongest teams. As for a number of shots, and uh, um, uh, 2023. Um, at the World Cups, uh, 37 kilometers for men and 117 for men. And as for the number of shots, uh, it was 570. Um, uh, so uh, there were 20, uh, two 23 seasonal competitions, three uh, that's, uh, respectively, and over 400 kilometers uh, women and 550 men uh, with the number of shots and 170. The overall we should uh, mention that among the uh, younger uh, competitors, uh, they had six, uh, six competitions in the Summer uh, Championship of Russia. We also had the All-Russian competition um, um, among the uh, uh, um, uh, young sportsmen, uh, 13, 16, uh, 17, 18, and the intermediate group. The overall number of uh, youngsters going into uh, Berlin uh, is 15,000, 15,000, so many numbers, it's impossible to get through them. C could you come up to the conclusions, and then we'll ask questions, if, if it's more convenient. All right. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it that way. In Russia, Biathlon is developing in Russia actively. The, uh, the teams of Russia are using the facilities that have category A and B. A. These are um, championships, world championships, and uh, Olympic Games. And then uh, uh, the, the problems of the biathlon development and skiing. Now, this all is associated with the well-prepared tracks, and, um, and uh, we must also have a proper way of providing snow to those. And to many, and Huntemansisk, there is uh, um, uh, um, uh, capacity for that. And uh, the analysis of the speed uh, um, um, of our um, uh, athletes shows that we still have problems with the speed. As for shooting um, uh, uh, prone, we're at the uh, global level, but as for standing, we're still um, with problems. So as for the sanctions on the Berlin Federation. Now, have uh, uh, these athletes decided what to do, their coaches? Are they going to take part in the next Olympic Games if the situation is the same under the neutral flag? Uh, if um, um, they, they, it is still impossible for the um, athletes to use any sort of the national insignia. So how will the Russian Berlin develop at the international arena? So I said it's developing. I said that there are... Uh, different age categories, the number of starts uh, um, is ex almost excessive. Uh, uh, 40, 42 starts. As for the international starts, well, of course, this, this is something that we consider at the Union of uh, Biathlon. And uh, in May, we will have a joint uh, session with the World uh, Federation and with the uh, Federation of Belarus uh, in order to discuss uh, the, the possibility of taking part in the international competitions. Still, in 2023, the number of international starts, has it gone down or is it at the same level? International starts. The number of international starts has not gone up, no. The International Union of Biathlonists is not going to increase that number. Uh, the, the, there is a certain number of athletes who said that um, there is a, an excessive number of starts, and, uh, and um, uh, we really. Uh, so there is no need in the increase of international starts. No, as the system of uh, the existing starts works well enough in Russia, is sufficient, sufficient. So the. 
the athletes do not really feel that um, uh, that um, it's very bad that the international starts are not there. For the Russian uh, athletes, that's exactly what they're missing. They're missing the international competitions, yes. Yes, of course. The Belarusian team, these are champions of the Olympic Games. Uh, they're there. They do have champions of Olympic Games. The winners, um, they, it's a strong team. But still, we would like to compete with the Norwegians, with Swedes, and all the others. Uh, all the other strong athletes. Thank you very much. We understand that uh, no matter what, uh, the competition uh, in, um, uh, is very much required, and the athletes um, in Berlin need that. So we hope that at the next Congress we will listen to you again, but it will be um, not only numbers, uh, but we would like to learn more about trends. Statistics is one thing, but um, it's more important to know what the conclusions are. Maybe you will write about that uh, for our journal, Theory and Practice. Now, uh, now uh, I haven't been able to speak about the trends because of the time limit. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right. Well, it's unfortunate, but uh, uh, here uh, there are people who differ from those who were at the beginning. Our session was quite successful. Most of the presentations planned uh, were um, presented, and we listened um, to them. We had questions. Many of the um, issues raised uh, for discussion at the session were uh, considered. Now, now, together with our presidium, we will look at the proposals for the improvement uh, of the work of the Congress, and uh, um, uh, we will also discuss the resolution. So we will prepare our presentations for the final plenary session, and uh, 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 then um, tomorrow we will describe the results of the work today. You're welcome to the master classes now. Uh, it's going to be quite interesting there as well. Thank you very much, and all the best to you. <coughs>